do one thing. No. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Hi, Madeline. Hey. Welcome, Madeline. Hi. Hi. We have, it's after 635, so I think all the attendees are here. There's 40 right now, and we have a quorum of the commission. Okay. While we start then with the preamble? Yeah. Okay. So, um, pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, extended by Chapter 2 of the Acts of 2023, this public hearing and meeting of the Talents Historical Commission is being conducted via remote participation. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so via Zoom or by telephone. Uh, no in-person attendance and members of the public will be permitted. A hyperlink to the hearing has been posted on the town's calendar. In accordance with the provisions of Article 3.6 of Amherst General Bylaws, uh, preservation of historically significant buildings. This public hearing has been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted and mailed uh, to parties at interest. Um, the Amherst Historical Commission is holding this public hearing to provide an opportunity for interested citizens to be heard regarding um, the demolition application request and um, of the Jones Library. Okay, so the public hearing is open. We can do a roll call attendance, Madeline. Sometimes you're a little you, you're a little staticky. I don't know if it's. I am okay. I was wondering about that. All right, maybe I'll switch out my. Can you hear me now? Yeah, that's good. Okay. We lost it. It's my tried and true mess uh, headphones. Okay. Um, so first we're going to hear um, a presentation from the applicant. We'll just start there. Um, and the, um, so we're, but okay, before that, um, so we're going to open both hearings at the same time tonight, uh, the demolition hearing and the preservation restriction hearing. Uh, we're not holding a hearing regarding uh, Section 106 review at this time. Um, so the sequence of the hearing is as follows. First, we'll address the demolition hearing um, for the demolition bylaw, and then we'll move on to the preservation restriction. Um, for each, we'll hear the applicant's presentation um, we'll have questions from commissioners and staff, followed by public comment. And then um, after that will be discussion. So as a reminder, we will get to public comment after questions by staff and commissioners. And in both hearings, we consider the changes to the project that have occurred since the public hearings on September 14th and October 19th, um, 2023. 
at that time, the Amherst Historical Commission approved the project in those hearings. Um, so we're considering changes to the project since then. Um, today, these are related to the value engineering components um, to the building and landscape. So we'll have a um, the demolition bylaw um, hearing. Uh, demolition bylaw. We'll, we will address that first. Um, we'll re review the project on the de demolition bylaw because over 25% of the facade um, would be impacted. So in this portion of the hearing, we discuss um, whether the demolition of the non-historic structure, the 1990s edition, whether the demolition of that has an adverse impact on the existing 1928 library. Um, so first we're going to have the team, um, the applicant present um, the changes to, um, that, they, that they've been making for uh, the value engineering. Um, okay, so do we have the team yeah. available? Yeah, if you raise your hand, if you're part of the presentation team, we'll, we'll bring you in as panelists. Okay, is this everybody? I think so, yeah. Okay. Um, right, so um, you can present the changes to the to the project since that have occurred since since the last hearing. So thank you uh, for the opportunity to present tonight. My name is Austin Serrett. I'm on the Jones Library Board of Trustees and chair the Jones Library Building Committee. We were really grateful and appreciative of the thorough consideration of the proposal, uh, the careful questions that the Historic Commission asked when we were before you before. Uh, we took seriously what it was that you said about the proposal. We're back tonight with a pretty narrower focus. The narrow focus, as you said, um, Madeline, is on the changes. Uh, we're not here to discuss the 106 process we're not here to discuss historic tax credits. What we're here to do is to talk about what has changed. Uh, nothing that I think you are gonna see tonight uh, relates to parts of the project uh, that you have previously approved in any significant way. It doesn't change them. So what we've asked our colleagues from FAA and, and um, the landscape architecture firm to do is to talk about the changes and to focus on, um, on, on those. And we look forward to uh, your questions and again, appreciate your time. So um, Ellen, are you gonna? Sure, I, I, I'm, Josephine's gonna do the pre presentation, but I just wanted to say hi to everybody. I'm here in, um, Principal at from Feingold Alexander Architects. Take it away, Josephine. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Let me know when, when it appears. Can everybody see this? Yeah. Yes, thank you. Great, so we'll jump right in. Um, thank you, Austin, um, for that um, intro. And as he mentioned, we're gonna jump right into um, the changes that we've been looking at this summer. Sorry, so, Josephine, can you, just, can you um, turn up the volume a little bit? I, 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 I oh, find sure. it a little hard to hear and I just wanna make sure all the, everyone else can hear. Yeah. Is that better? Yeah. Great. 
So um, this is the list of items that we're going to run through tonight. Um, these are um, the impacts to um, the exterior of the building and the site. Um, so um, just to touch upon the architectural VE items, um, the first one on the list here is the alternate um, that we are proposing, um, which is a change to the, of the synthetic slate on the existing 1928 building to an asphalt shingle um, only at the existing um, building. Um, the second one is an alternate as well, and that is to omit the replacement of the sashes at the existing windows, of the 1928 building. Um, the third one on the list here is the removal of the roof monitor. Um, that's in the new edition. And then the uh, fourth one is the changes to the curtain wall windows um, to uh, just a pre-glazed aluminum window. Um, so I will pass the landscape portion here on to Rachel. Thanks, Josephine. Yeah, and, and outside the building in the site, um, we've tried to identify items that could be deferred for later as funds became available, um, as well as itemize, th find things that might have larger price tags uh, to help with the VE process. So some of the items that, um, that are deferred until a later point um, include the Goshen stone benches at the front of the library and the back, deferring the children's courtyard area, um, deferring the stormwater garden planting. We're going to use no mo mix instead, and we have some images to show you what that might look like. Um, we reconfigured the grading, and we were able to eliminate the rain garden bridge crossings. We have an image which shows you what that looks like. Um, the fire department area where, uh, where existing utilities today um, exit the library and connect to um, Pleasant, North Pleasant Street. Uh, we have been able to reduce that extent of work um, and still provide the utilities for the library. Um, we've eliminated one of the front subsurface stormwater systems and um, have enlarged the system at the back to compensate. And then we've um, eliminated the granite cladding. So that's just the front surface of the retaining wall at the historical society property. Um, and we're replacing it with a color admix or possibly slating it for a future mural by, by local artist. So we'll jump right into the um, renderings and we'll run through the architectural first and then um, again, pass it on to um, Rachel um, to talk about the landscape. Um, so in this slide here, um, as you can see from this rendering, um, most of the changes are um, on the, the landscape front, but we'll um, just quickly talk about the architectural. Um, so in this view here, the changes would be to the, um, the, the alternates only, and that would be to the roof. So that would be a, um, an asphalt um, shingle on this portion of the building and, um, and to these existing windows, which would um, as an alternate, be um, retained. Um, okay. You cannot see the um, the roof monitor from this view, so that's all. Is that's all for the architectural changes in this perspective? Yeah, and the front landscape as a whole looks really similar to what you saw before. Um, we still are maintaining the historic character of the site, um, and the we still have the magnolia trees out front that we were proposing, and the sourwood tree. They're all um, well adapted for climate change and that will not overpower the front facade of the building. But what, another change here is that we did swap out, uh, we had ruby slippers hydrangea and we swapped it out with um, a purple variety called color fantasy. It also is purple, so we we're able to tighten up that color palette in the front to be purple, white, and, and yellow. Um, in the areas where the Goshen stone benches were, we have filled in with more of the Cunningham white rhododendron. So um, that'll look like a continuous hedgerow in the front. I think that's it for this, this view. And so this next view um, at the opposite angle, um, again, for architectural um, in this view, we are only looking at the existing roof and the existing windows. Um, to be potential changes. And similarly, um, you can see from, from this view that it's very similar to what you saw before. 
from the site point of view, um, the, the Goshen stone benches have been replaced with the continuous hedgerow in the front. Uh, and the children's area is on the other side of that hedgerow. Um, but your view from the street and from the corner will be very similar, even though the children's courtyard is no longer there in a paved form. Okay. And this is one of our rare views. And in this view, you can see the removal of the roof monitor. Um, and so um, in this um, proposed view here at the bottom corner, you can see where it was. And um, that is now removed from this perspective. Um, and then just one slight change to the, the windows is that they are no longer a curtain wall. Um, these punched windows would now be um, just a traditional um, aluminum window. So there's no more projection. And that's all for the architectural. Okay. And from this view in the landscape, um, you can see, or we'll, we have another view for you to look at, but you can see the, the large Goshen stone bench at the back of the plaza has been removed. Um, and there's been a change in the planting down um, in the garden. This view does show the, we, this view is looking from within the historical society property, looking out towards the library property. Um, the fence that's in the foreground is a historical society fence and that will be re, uh, temporarily uh, removed during construction for the construction of the wall, um, but it'll be replaced at a location de determined by the historical society. There will be some, they've also asked us to transplant some hostas and thus, um, gently remove some of the ocean stone pavers to, and replace them at the end of the project. So our, our documents reflect that. And the similar view, just um, slightly to the east. Um, again, you can see that the um, there was a sliver here of a roof monitor that you could see previously. And, um, and now that is no longer in view. This is probably the area we've, where we've made the most changes within the landscape, and a lot of them are below grade. Um, we were able to reconfigure. We had one large basin before with two bridges across, um, and instead we now have three three basins that have walkways in between. Um, so that was the biggest change below grade. Then within the rain garden itself, uh, we've deferred the rain garden plantings, so all the perennials and carex and other textures, but we are going to use a Nomo seed mix, which is a, a mix of different types of fes fescue. They grow to about 18 inches tall, um, and then they flop over and create like a wave, wave forms in the landscape. It's something that actually um, will reduce maintenance costs. Um, you only, you'd, it's recommended to mow once a year, um, if the library wanted to mow more frequently, they could, but it gets mown to a higher height. So it's better, um, it's better adapted for all sorts of different conditions. And it kind of has that, that softer garden aesthetic. It's also a material that, um, will stabilize the site and that we can intersperse planting with bulbs and other, other perennials over time. Um, so that's the biggest planting change. And then a note here in the, in the foreground, you can see the, the reddish tree, that's a sassafras tree. So we are we are keeping the trees that were originally proposed in the plan with sassafras and the swamp white oak, the big shade trees in the project are still in. Um, at the back, the Goshen stone bench, which was at the edge of the patio, um, separating it from the rain garden has been deferred till later. And then you'll see the, uh, the retaining wall um, between the historical society property and the library used to have a granite veneer and, and that has been eliminated, um, but that veneer is only facing the library itself. That's it, that's you. Um, this is a site plan summarizing those changes from a, from the, from a big overall picture. Um, so at the front of the library, we've removed the subsurface system in the front. We've deferred the children's patio and deferred the Goshen stone benches. At the back of the library, we've reconfigured the grading and stormwater um, to, to reduce cost. And then we've reduced um, the square footage of our, of our work within the fire, fire station parking lot. 
And then at the Historical Society property, we um, actually have included some scope at the request of the Historical Society uh, for that post-construction finishing. Next. And then the other piece is that with the elimination of the, the Ocean Stone seat walls, um, they were also providing some um, some soft ambient lighting along the sidewalk, and we are we needed to add some more lights to um, address the loss in foot candles. So this this diagram is showing the adjustments that we've made to the plan with the lighting fixture placement. So we've added two bollards to the front landscape where those benches were. And we've shifted some bollards to the to the outside of the front. Um, also, a part of the value engineering exercise, we reduced the number of catenary lights in the in the north patio area, and we've added two um, wall fixtures uh, along the walkway. These all um, help provide uniformity and still meet the requirements for for lighting and cameras. I think that closes out our slides. Okay, is that the, that's your final slide for this presentation? It is. Okay, yeah. great. Um, okay, so first to the commissioners, we need to just ask questions and we'll open up discussion regarding, this is just the demolition hearing portion demolition bylaw portion of the hearing. So we can discuss and ask questions um, regarding that. And then later we're going to move on to discuss um, the preservation restriction. So right now, um, if we have any questions for the applicant, um, we can ask those regarding uh, the demolition bylaw. So I have one. Um, we are, I'm curious what's happening to the north and west walls that the new addition would butt up against. Will they be encased or will they be demolished? So the north and west wall will be interior walls and they're not going to be demolished. They'll be visible from the interior of the building. Okay, so that's still the case. Um, are there any other questions regarding this portion? I I do have a question. Um, <clears throat> the change to asphalt on the roof is concerning is maintaining the windows because they will eventually need to be replaced. I'm just wondering if it's possible to go out with a bid asking for for both what one bid asking for the the artificial slate and new windows and another bid asking for the asphalt and retaining the windows that is our intention to go out with the uh, bid alternatives thank you thank you austin so nate how do you suggest we move forward here because i feel like we all want to ask questions about the design which is really related to the preservation restriction um, but I want to kind of maintain just to keep us in line with just addressing the demolition bylaw right now. Um, so we just want to discuss or just ask question related to how the demolition of the, if, if there's any differences here in, in how the demolition of the 1990s edition affects the historic building. Yeah, Hetty has her hand raised. I think, yeah, I mean, so, you know, the building commissioner thought this needed to become, come back to review uh, before the commission because, you know, the commission approved demolition based on a, a set of plans, you know, so many months ago and they've changed. And it's it's not just the building, it's the site as well. And so, you know, is, you know, is the, the everything that was shown here, you know, does the commission feel that that is the same project and, you know, is it sufficient? Does it meet the standards in the bylaw or not in terms of demolition of the 1927 28 building? Um, I know, Josephine, that there's a slide further in the presentation. And I think it'd be worth sharing, showing what's happening with that north wall and just, you know, we can mark it up in Zoom to show what's happening. 
Um, and, and, you know, I could pull up an image, but yeah, I think that, uh, you know, most of the 28 building is being retained. And so some of the questions remain about, you know, where the new building will meet the existing building. And then, you know, is, you know, as part of the, the, the bylaw for the preservation of historically significant structures, it's also what's happening with the reuse of the building in proposed designs. And so, you know, does the commission feel that these changes are still in keeping with, you know, the original structure and what was proposed, you know, when we reviewed it last fall? And so, um, you know, that's, that's kind of the, the discussion point tonight in terms of the preservation bylaw. Eddie, um, Nate and Madeline, um, I, I guess I'm having a bit of a sense of deja vu from the first time we all got involved in this process with the demolition delay and the presentation of the project prior to value engineering. I know that's not our purview tonight, but the two things are interrelated, the demolition of the 1993 building and parts of the 1928 building um, are still in play. Um, the removal of the memorial garden in the back is still in play for what is in value engineering terms an extremely generic and poor product in my opinion. Um, and so I'm finding it really difficult at this point that I don't have a way of saying that I don't think we should dem demolish the 1993 building at this point. I think the new information that we have, that we've learned about since July, is making me really hone to my job as a commissioner, which is to observe the bylaw of the town and to take care of a historic structure that is absolutely critical to our historic, char uh, our historic character as a place, as a unique place in the valley. Um, so I... I won't say any more than that, but I think it could even be possible at this point to vote to rescind earlier prior <laughs> approvals, because I think that's an option that we could take. Yeah, I mean, so I, I would like to see a slide showing the new addition in the library, you know, the current library like we had before and just outline what's happening with that north wall and those other features. Am I allowed to say anything? Or is it too late? No, I think this is kind of the question and answer session, uh, you know, part of the hearing with the commission and the and the presenters. Great. Ellen, go ahead. Yeah, I just I just want to make the point we haven't changed anything. All of this, we and I'm, I'm just trying to make it clear, none of that that was approved was changed. The only thing was changed, which Josephine and Rachel outlined, M minor, ch you know, minor changes. So that's what that's what we were hoping to keep our focus to. But again, that it, it seems like we're opening the whole thing up again when we were only looking for a couple of, um, a cup, you know, a couple of minor a couple of changes i think it's really difficult to comment at this point because of of what i now know the head of the massachusetts historical commission has written about this project as a, an architectural historian as someone on the commission it is very difficult for me to look at those letters that evidence that support for what is being changed in this building and say, wait a minute here, we can't go forward at this point. So may I just say, may I say something, Madeline? Sure. So again, we're grateful for the work that everybody is doing and the efforts. Um, as we understand it, the Historic Commission does very valuable work, but it has a limited purview here. It's not the Massachusetts Historic Commission. It's not charged to um, examine interior changes to the building. And uh, people's feelings about the what is being done to the historic character of the building 
uh, that's that's fine. But we're here under a preservation restriction and for a demolition permit. And the demolition permit was granted before nothing has changed. Well, I think that there has been changes to the overall design, right? And so in terms of the value engineering, and so, you know, that's why it's coming back to the commission for the demolition review. So if, for instance, the commission allowed demolition last year because they thought what was being presented was, you know, a project that didn't impact the 28 structure, but they think that some of the value engineering will, then they could have a different opinion about how they reviewed the demolition. And so, Hetty, to your point, um, you know, some of the a local commission can have a different opinion than the Massachusetts Historical Commission. And so, you know, the 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 Massachusetts Historical Commission was writing in response to um, an application for historic uh, tax credits and not necessarily, you know, looking at it through our local demolition bylaw or the preservation restriction. And so, I think the discussion about the landscape and some other pieces uh, can be, um, you know, more about when we're looking at the preservation restriction. In terms of the demolition bylaw, you know, if we look at it, they're removing a 90s edition and they're putting on a new edition. Does the removal of the 90s edition and then this new edition impact the 28 structure to a point where you know, there should be a delay or can it be authorized and move forward? And so, uh, you know, that's where I think, to me, I still like to know what's happening with that wall because we say it'll be visible, but I just want to confirm that because, you know, things we hear and read claim otherwise. And so it'd be important tonight for me to understand what is happening with that back wall. Uh, and then, um, you know, and if there's any, then the, the commission could ask other questions, but I I'd still think it would be nice to have you know, I can pull up a screen and it'd be nice to walk through it uh, just to understand it. So I can go ahead and share my screen. Nate, you had mentioned that it was part of this presentation, but I think if you want to see that, we would have to pull up the last presentation. Well, the one that is online that we were we were emailed that's in the packet shows the the proposed floor plans and the existing floor plans. And so does that work? The floor plans? Yeah, yeah, I think if we looked at the proposed, you know, like ground level or first floor level floor plan, then I think just by marking up right. in Zoom, you know, annotating in Zoom would just be, would clarify it. Right. Let's first look at just how the new will, will interact with, with the existing building first. Everybody see that? Yes. Okay. Can you show us just yes where the so, the exterior walls sure will be? These, um, these go from existing to proposed views. So we'll just start at level one, and and so at level one, um, I think we're referencing these walls here. Mm -hmm. And so if we go to the proposed, as you can see, these gray walls are still in place as we're retaining them. And now they'll be within the adult um, fiction section and the adult new material section and near the stairs. And what about the, the, the next section, the lower section right there of the north facing wall? Uh, I'm sorry, I lost you, the lower section. Well, so, you know, what about this wall? Like what's happening here? Oh, that's all retained as well. Yeah, so everything that you see in light gray hatch is an existing wall. Is it encased or is it visible from the interior? It's visible. Josephine, one quick thing. Some of that wall in the children's area is is being removed. That's right, right. right there, yeah. A little portion here, yes. That's yes, removed. but a lot of the, that was altered in the night. Some of it was altered in the 1990 edition. That's right. And that was proposed to be removed previously when the commissioner reviewed it. 
Correct. No, yes, not, nothing has changed. On the nothing has interior. changed in the plan. Okay. Does anyone else, else have any questions from the commissioners? I, th I think there's clarity in what the proposed value engineering changes are. And um, that is where we should be focusing, right? In my, in my opinion. And um, I've spoken to the fact of, of asking for two bids to retain the faux fo slate roof and um, um, to replace the windows as opposed to the, the other alternative, which would be shingles and retaining the windows. I'm satisfied with that. I think the exterior um, of, of delaying some of the original proposal doesn't have to do with our preservation and our, in my opinion, our, our uh, demolition bylaw related to the 1928 building. Well, I think if there's no more questions from the commission, we could open up to public comment. Matt, on what do you think? Let's do that. And um, let's see. So uh, please, everyone who wants to speak, please raise your hand. Um, so there's many people in attendance today. Um, so we're going to keep comments to two minutes each. Um, and we will talk about the preservation restriction later. And um, right now we're just discussing the demolition piece. Um, what's happening to, to the old building in, um, as it meets, as it meets uh, in relate, <laughs> only related to the demolition of the, of the addition. Okay. And we're also not discussing the interior today. Um, so we'll open it up to, to public comment. Sure. Looks like uh, Carol, you're the have your hand raised first. You can unmute yourself. Thank you, uh, Carol Gray, 815 Southeast Street. I would like to say to the commissioners, I thank you for your service. Your duty is to apply the law. It is not to feel like you've made a decision in the past and you can't do anything about it, even if you think it's legally wrong now. Uh, I was very concerned that one of the commissioners raised a concern that she would like to rescind. And the staff member, Nate Malloy, said, let's talk about the wall. The commissioners are the people who are empowered in this hearing, not town staff. And commissioners should only apply the law. I'd also say at the outset that if there's anyone with a conflict of interest, they should not take any part in this decision. I have heard that one of the commissioners is or was a student of Austin Surratt's at Amherst College. If that is true, that is a conflict of interest. They should not have any legal role in the discussion or in the vote, and they should be withdrawn from this hearing. Um, even the appearance of a conflict of interest is a legal reason to, to step out of the discussion and have no vote. In terms of the legality of things, you said that you made a decision previously and you can't go back on that. However, you made that decision without hearing any of the evidence about the adverse impacts. That's like deciding that someone is, is guilty without hearing the evidence first. You now have a memo that has many different standards that are clearly being violated. To me, it's it's it, there's no question about this. And by by adhering to a decision that is legally wrong, you're setting up the town for a lawsuit that could cost tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars. And it's just not your job legally. So look at the standards. Standard two, and again I'm referring to the the uh the standards that were set out by the head of the uh, the executive director, Brioni Simone. So standard two says the historical character of the property will be retained, including spatial relationships. 
How could anyone think that what's being proposed is in a spatial relationship with the historic character of the Jones Library? I look at those designs and I was trying to figure out where is Amity Street? I almost couldn't even recognize the historic library that we all know and love and that you have the legal duty to preserve the character of. That is being violated. Standard five, the distinctive features finishes will be preserved. The slate shingles, replacing them with asphalt when they're right at the front. They're, and it says right in their materials that it's clear that the slate uh, is still available. It's still being quarried. There's absolutely no reason you should allow asphalt shingles. It's a total violation of your duty. Standard six, that the new feature will match the old in design, color, texture. Who are we kidding? This is like comparing comparing the Earth to to Jupiter. They don't match. You you you. These two things have nothing in common. You're taking a building that you wish didn't have historic legalities around it, but it does, and you're trying to to push a push a Mack truck through a keyhole. They there's no way that the historic character is being matched. Standard nine. Again, keep okay. The Thirty seconds. Matched. Keep the spatial relationships in character with the property. There is nothing that's keep being kept in terms of the historic spatial relationships. Standard 10, new additions and adjacent or related new construction will be undertaken in a manner that if removed in the future, the essential form and integrity of the historic property and its environment will be unimpaired. Are you kidding me? You remove that huge addition and you have a fragment, a shell of what we loved as our historic building. None of those standards are being met. It's clear you have a legal duty. The head of the State Historic Commission is telling you they're not being met. You should vote to rescind immediately, today. You made a bad decision before with no evidence. Correct it today. Um, also, because there's two public hearings, I request the right to be heard in the second public hearing as well. Thank you for your time. Please be courageous. Town staff has a political agenda. Your job is not to be pressured by town okay, staff. Thank you. To oppose the law. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Uh, so just to comment, th all those comments are, those standards are related to the preservation bylaw and not the demolition bylaw. And so that'll be the second part of the hearing tonight. And so, you know, if you want to focus on, you know, how did the changes or what's happening to the 28 structure, but the rehabilitation standards and the letters from Mass Historic relate to the preservation bylaw and not as much as to the town's demolition bylaw. Rob, you're, you can unmute yourself. I just have. Um... I'm reporting from the West Coast, so I hope you can hear me from this far away. Uh, again, I just want to thank all of you, even people with whom I probably have some disagreement over for at least putting the time and effort into uh, trying to understand what's right for the community, as well as what follows the law. Can, can you hear me? I'm getting a message that... Yes. Okay. Yeah, okay. Okay. Um, while I, it may not be driving a Mack truck through a keyhole, I think there is a metaphor that's more apt here, which is from, uh, I believe, the Odyssey, uh, the metaphor oh, of Scylla okay. and Charybdis. Okay. You're in a, between a rock and a hard place, mm -hmm. literally and figuratively. Figuratively, you know, you're dealing with a population, which includes me, that think you've gone a little bit too far. Literally, you're creating a structure that even with these minor changes in the so-called value engineering, you've tipped the balance, I think, in favor of at least requiring a demolition delay, if not scrapping much of the proposed project. Uh, whether you agree with me or not, I think the latest things, including the asphalt roof, some of the changes to the, to the rear, cosmetic as they may be, it really tips the balance from something that was questionably reasonable to something that I find more and more detestable, I'm afraid. And I'm a, I'm a longtime library supporter, by the way. The, the thing I want to ask you guys is the following. I don't know whether further demolition delay is something within the purview of this evening's, this part of this evening's hearing. If it is, I urge you to take the additional six months that the bylaw may allow you to think this through carefully. I, I don't think you realize the extent to which 
the current project as well as the project up till the last decision has torn the community apart. And I want you to consider one other thing when considering that demolition delay. If the addition, the expansion, and the, whatever demolition takes place were to happen, and then the new building after 20, 30, 50 years, perhaps, needs to be demolished, what will be left of the 1928 structure, the 1993 structure, what will be left to work from again? And I think if you pause and think about that, you may come to where I am, which is that you should at least give this another six months or whatever the maximum amount of delay is possible. I hope you'll respect that this, this view on things because I, I don't think you're harming yourselves and I think you may be benefiting the community as a whole by doing that. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Jeff, you can unmute yourself. Thanks, it's Jeff Lee. I live in South Amherst and two institutions, though perhaps thinking they were doing a good turn for the town, have been instrumental in promoting the excessively large and costly Jones Library building project to the detriment of the building's historic character. Amherst College's influence over the proposed plan is clear. Amherst College professor and trustee president Austin Sarrett and former college fundraiser and capital campaign co-chair Kent Ferber were among the strategists forming the Library Feasibility Committee who hatched the idea of seeking a state construction grant to demolish a 30-year-old addition, expand the already larger than average library building, and transform the Jones into a community hub. They may have been guided by Amherst College's pattern of tearing down still useful buildings in the name of progress and erecting modern replacements at a cost of millions. Consider the demolition of Walker Hall, once known as the college's Acropolis, the McKim, Mead, and White Little Red Schoolhouse that the college shared with the town, and the 58-year-old Merrill Science Center. However, this approach does not work for the town of Amherst. We don't have a $3.5 billion endowment, and we are committed to historic preservation, as evidenced by our establishment of the Amherst Historical Commission. Yet even before leaders proposed drastic value engineering cuts, the Mass Historic Commission noted at least seven adverse impacts from the project in violation of five federal standards for historic rehabilitation. The second institution that has encouraged Amherst to abandon preservation goals is the Mass Board of Library Commissioners. In 2011, an MBLC representative dangled the prospect of a multi-million dollar grant before new library director Sharon Shari, asking, what are you gonna do something about this library? Unfortunately, the MBLC imposes a cookie cutter approach to recipients of its construction grants. They wanna see expanded space for programming, long sight lines and transformation from a temple of learning to a community hub. In Amherst's case, this was regardless of a survey that showed a large majority of patrons to be happy with the current library and only about half who reported attending library programs. Amherst MBLC grant was the largest of 33 awards across the state. It required the town to commit funding $25 million or more from tax revenues, an enormous liability for a town the size of Amherst. When costs rose, project leaders were forced to make severe design changes, such as replacing the slate roof with asphalt, dropping historically compatible window replacement, and relegating the Whipple window to a wall hanging. Please show your commitment to historic preservation. Delay demolition and require total compliance with the preservation restrictions. Thanks for your comment. Hi, right, Leticia, you can unmute yourself. Hello, can you hear me? I'm Leticia LaFollette. Um, I live on Dana Street and I wanna thank the Historic Commission and everyone who presented <clears throat> material today for their hard work. Um, it's a little confusing to those of us who are in the public to know which part of the hearing to give our comments to. Um, we've already heard several people who have commented on the second part of the hearing, so I may be doing the same. But my area of expertise is actually architectural history of the ancient world. Um, my expertise lies in the city of Rome itself and Roman architecture there. And much of what I've learned, I think, can be applied to this project. Rome is both a city of monuments, 
but also a living civic center. Um, so historic preservation efforts there have been careful to balance usage of buildings with their historic appearances. It is clear that we cannot continue to have the Jones Library look exactly the way it did in 1928. Um, so I think the idea of balance is critical to apply to this project. The Jones Library is not a museum. It does so much more than loan books. It functions as a community center with programs um, from ESL to child, young children and their families, teens, new immigrants, and giving them access to computers. Um, so I, would, I won't give you the full laundry list because I know you're all well aware that the Jones really serves as an inclusive center for Amherst as a community. This is why the renovation and expansion is so critical. There is not enough space for everything that Jones does and even the space it has is falling apart. Um, I urge you not to let abstract ideas of the perfect um, be the enemy of the good for this project. Replacing the roof is required. <laughs> Whether it's synthetic slate or asphalt, it's gonna to have to be done. It's not as if it's original slate, right? Um, so putting expensive requirements on the appearance of say the roof tiles may well jeopardize the project as would a six month delay. Um, it has nothing to do with the function of the building. And I think you really do need to balance the two. Um, um, and let's not, um, neglect operating under a budget here um, or weaponize climate change, which has been done about this. This project represents the first public building in town that will reflect Amherst's sustainability goals. Um, please don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good and let this project go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hi, Hilda, you can unmute yourself. Who are you recognizing right now? Uh, you, Hilda. Oh, can you hear me? Yes. Because yeah. I couldn't hear who you asked for. I'm not going to repeat everything that I said in my letter already, but looking at the plans for that building make me cry, literally, because the addition just does not work. With the, the angles of that gambrel roof make it look like a barn, and it clashes with the with the gambrel roof on the original building. I think you guys picked the wrong architect, but it's too late now to do anything about that. And I only bring you to the fact that I, I'm absolutely thrilled when I saw the first plans for the North Amherst Library that that addition complements the original 1893 building. And I'm not going into that because I already wrote it in the letter. But what I, I do have three questions that I do wanna bring up. And the first one is um, liability for the Stronghouse. Stronghouse is stone built on stone. I've never been in the cellar, but I'm assuming it's built like my own house, which was sitting on stones. And I'm worried about the hundreds of tons of debris and the vibrations from the wrecking ball, what are they gonna do to the stone foundation and the plaster and the strong house? Nowhere in any of the documents over 10 years have I seen anybody taking any responsibility for that. Whether it's the strong house has to absorb it or the contractor, I don't know, but I'm really worried about damage to that building. And I, I know from my friends who own houses on next to Kendrick Park, just rebuilding that road, the dishes in their cabinets are shaking. And that's a much smaller project than the whole 1993 building being swept out of it. So that that's my, my big concern. Who's responsible for what happens to Strong House and who's gonna repair it? It's not gonna be cheap. And then the other thing that has to do with demolition is the issue of the book return at the front door. I don't think you need to make a hole through the stone to put the book return there. That means anybody coming by, by car or 
or who's handicapped or whatever is going to want to be going to that front door, getting out of the car to return books. There are other places that can be put that, that aren't visible from the street, or at least not that visible from the street, that the stones from Pelham have to be removed to put it in. Um, then, and that, that's part of the demolition. And I don't know whether it's part of, when that got changed, it was decided somewhere along the line, since you made your decision, that they would not have the automated book sorter. So you don't need to have the, the hole in the wall where everybody can see it at the front door if there isn't going to be a book sorter on the other side of it. And then my last issue was the question about the windows. I, I live in a 1737 house. We found the original eight over 12 windows in the barn and had them reproduced when we restored this house 50 years ago. And they were covered with um, triple track storm windows all these years, which I hated because I couldn't open and close them, et cetera, et cetera. So one of the first things that I did seven years ago when I didn't have somebody in the house telling me, no, I can't spend that money, I went and changed all my windows to, to um, using the old windows we can, which we had made in 1974, use those windows and replace the single panes with one large um, insulated double glass. Um, 20 and seconds. Put, and put new one. So I mean, the, the the all windows here could be fixed at a price that's a lot less expensive than buying new ones. And I've I've heard that several times on this old house. People who restore all windows. And I know there's a place in Montague that specializes in institutional historical windows. Okay. Um, that that job can be done. It doesn't have to be left by the wayside. You can put insulated windows in for what I thought was a fairly reasonable place. Okay, thank you for your comment. Uh, Christopher, you can speak. Hi. I'm Christopher's wife, actually. My name is Mickey Rathbun. I'm using my husband's computer because it works better. Um, I have lived in Amherst for 33 years. Um, I have a bachelor's degree from the School of Architecture at the University of Virginia, where I studied historic preservation. I also have a law degree from the University of Virginia. Um, just one point regarding the scope of this hearing. Um, I read the minutes from the uh, commission's September 14th, 2023 hearing uh, regarding the demolition permit. And um, Robin, who I think at that time was chair, uh, she specifically stated in that hearing that any work approved by the historical commission that is later changed before construction is undertaken would require approval again before another meeting of the historic commission so the way i read that uh, is that any work that's previously been approved by the historical commission if it's later changed that work would again require approval so I think that there is plenty of um, room just reading that as um, from a legal point of view that the scope of this hearing does not need to be, nor should it be uh, controlled, it limited to just the um, recent value engineering changes. Um, I'd also like to just uh, say that as a trial lawyer in New York, I wrote a lot of jury instructions, and the instructions always boil down to a simple proposition. Jurors must apply the relevant law to the facts of the case and determine whether the law has been violated. Extraneous facts or personal opinions must be disregarded. As members of the commission, 
you have a similar role. You must apply the town's historic preservation standards to the proposed library expansion and demolition plan. It is not your job to consider other aspects of the project, such as cost or need or timelines. The relevant standards that have been incorporated into the uh, town uh, historic preservation by laws are the Secretary of the Interior's standards for the rehabilitation of historic properties. Those are the standards that Brona Simon, the executive director of the Massachusetts Historical Commission, applied when she twice rejected the town's application for historic tax credits. Like a responsible juror, she made a thorough point-by-point -point analysis of the 10 standards as they related to the proposed plan, and she concluded that the plan failed to meet five of the 10 standards. Unfortunately, the library director failed to share with the commission uh, Ms. Simon's findings. To the best of my knowledge, these letters are being brought to your attention for the first time uh, in preparation for this hearing. I hope that you have taken the time to read them. Uh, clearly, your deliberations henceforth must be guided by Simon's conclusions. Uh, uh, Austin Serrett said, well, those aren't our standards. Well, I think they are. Um, and if there aren't the standards, then I think it's incumbent upon the uh, Historic Commission to tell us what the standards are. Um, I know that the Council Commission has been under a lot of pressure from the town, from the Library Building Committee and the trustees to approve the expansion and demolition plan without question. But I urge you not to let any personal or professional connections you may have to distract you from your charge as members of the Amherst Historic Commission. It is not your job to rubber stamp plans that violate well-established standards for historic preservation. Thank you very much for your hard work and your service to the community. Thank you for your comment. Uh, hi, it's a phone number, 413-549-0810. You can um, unmute yourself by dialing star six. Um, yes. May I, I have a few comments. I'd like to reserve my right to make comments on the second portion of the proposal. My name is Vincent O'Connor. I live at 175 Summer Street in Amherst. Um, the first comment I would like to make is that um, that any member of the commission who has a, um, question, a connection to any of the proponents of the project, the, the, the chair of the building committee, the library director, whoever, um, the architectural firm, um, and, and public entities, Entity, any entity that has made a significant financial contribution to the library um, need, should have filed a declaration. And if they haven't, I, I would urge them not to participate. Um, the second is second comment that I have is that, in fact, um, the the Amherst Historical Commission has a role that is more powerful. Than the than the state's um, agency that uh, declined to provide to approve historic tax credits. The, a, that agency can simply not give you money, which they decided to do to not give not give this project money. The, his, the historical commission can delay this project and should. Um, they have and and thereby they have more power. The power not to contribute is, is, you know, lots of people have decided not to contribute. 
local agencies and individuals. But only the Historic Commission has the power to delay this project until uh, an appropriate um, uh, evaluation has taken place. Um, finally, um, in contradiction to a previous comment, this, this library is not the first project because it is not going to be the first project. The first project is going to be the, uh, the new elementary school at Fort River, um, which, is, which will meet all the standards in, in a way that this library project um, has, will continue to fail to do. So uh, those are my comments. I do reserve my right to, to comment on the second section of the of the hearing. Thank you for your comment. Maura, you can unmute yourself. Um, most of what I was going to say is, has already been said, but I did have three specific questions about the demolition that I don't think have been answered. The Whipple window, which fits beautifully in the 1993 edition, um, that was left hanging. What would happen to that? And the previous hearing that you had last fall, um, like Hilda said, there's really no need to cut through the stone for the in the front for the book drop. And the third thing is came up at the planning board meeting last night. Actually, that retaining wall go extends two feet underground closer to the strong house on the strong house um, property, which I guess the Amherst History Society has. Um, given permission to have, but there's no written agreement that I that I am aware of. There is also a large ash tree, which is within 10 feet of the construction that is supposed to be protected by having a certified arborist um, review the care of it and a $50,000 surety bond placed by the general contractor to protect that tree and the other two significant trees on the historic society property. Um, that was not a condition that was put on, on the project by the planning board last night. Uh, Christine Brestrup said that she thought there was a verbal agreement about the trees with the library between the library and the historical society. So I hope that um, agreement is more than a verbal agreement and that those trees will be protected through the construction. Okay, thank you for your comment. Uh, Elisa? I think you need to unmute. There you are. Thank you. I was clumsy with my mouse here. Um, I'm in favor of the renovation of the Jones Library to make it work for the future. I've lived in Amherst for 54 years now, almost. I dimly remember the library before the addition of the 1990s. I do not believe that addition works. I don't think it ever worked. It was cobbled together with a whole bunch of objectives to preserve at least a, a, the look of much of the old library, but it's very difficult to find your way around. So I don't understand people, I don't understand historic concern about that part of the library. It doesn't function as a library and I don't find it attractive. I do think that the function of the library is, as a previous speaker said, not a museum. It's a library and a community center. And historic preservation is important, but it's not the primary goal of the building. 
or of work on the building. I also would like to say that, yes, the town has been torn apart, but not building this building or renovation will not heal the divisions in the town. The divisions are there. They are on both sides, just like the elementary school we didn't build a decade ago. So it's not a solution to ill feeling to deny this building or to hold it up. So thank you. That's my comment. Thanks for your comment. Erica, you can unmute yourself. Hi, and thank you for hearing me tonight. Um, I want to say that this building has been changing in big and small ways since its inception. Um, and today we're holding multiple priorities. We have the opportunity now to make much needed updates to prepare this building for the next century and protect our history at the same time. The building is old and beautiful and much of it, the majority of it is being preserved and parts of it are even being made visible instead of being inaccessible to patrons. We shouldn't let an uncompromising preservation of every historical detail prevent equitable access to the building spaces for its staff and for its patrons. We shouldn't make the history of the building a roadblock against progress that we need to make on behalf of the wonderful institution that it is and future generations. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Arlie, you can unmute yourself. Um, hi. Um, uh, first, I guess partly in response to the last comment, but also seconding other people. You know, again, your job is pretty narrow. It's to deal with the historic preservation of the assets in the town. And it's not to deal with whether the future or this or who's going to use it and how and what it means. Um, so I would agree that, as somebody else said, you have the authority and the power in this situation as the historical commission. You decide the historic character of this town. And in this demolition, I do find it confusing because I'm not good at looking at architectural plans. I'm, I wasn't trained to do that. I'm not an architectural history person. I'm a resident of the town following this. Um, and all I have to go on are the Mass Historic Commission letters. You know, those are the experts and that's what I am taking. Um, they say there's problems with the demolition aspect of this um, project, and the main one that immediately zoomed into me was the one about if this were to be removed in the future, what would the 1928 building look like? And from their point of view, it wouldn't look very good. Um, and that's what, but tonight's conversation, I think maybe I'm not understanding clearly how much of these exterior walls are being demolished in order to put the addition on. I, I guess I don't really understand that, but from that letter, it sounds like it's significant so that if you took it away, you'd have sort of a shambles there. So, um, you know, as I've always said, less demolition, more historic preservation. And I don't think pitting historic preservation against, you know, meeting the needs of the patrons of the library is a good idea. Plus, that's not your job. Your job is historic preservation. That's why you exist. So please exercise your authority on that dimension. You're not about the programming. The MBLC talks all about programming. They don't care about historic preservation. They're not trying to, you know, protect the library in that sense. So you don't have to be thinking about, you know, the future and what this is going to be used for. 
as they say in a few decades, this may be demolished, just as we're demolishing the 93 edition now. So, you know, how the 28 structure is being impacted is the only thing that matters, really, I think, in terms of how much of it is being demolished. So that's my question, because I'm not that clear about it. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Maria, you can unmute yourself. Thank you, Maria Kopicki, South Amherst. I'm gonna read from the website for the Amherst Historic Commission. Created in October, 1972 by Amherst Town Meeting, the Amherst Historical Commission is charged under local and state law with quote, the preservation, protection and development of the historical and archeological resources of the town, end quote. The commission is responsible for implementing the Amherst Preservation Plan for the entire community. The Massachusetts Historical Commission was very clear that the demolition that is intended for the 1928, large amounts of demolition and impact on the 1928 building is unacceptable. You know, people are talking about a lot of things. I think that at this point, it should be pretty clear to people that this is the wrong project. A project could have been undertaken that could have respected historic preservation, that could have respected all of the needs, but that's not what you have before you. And you don't have that. You can't do anything about that. You're stuck with this proposed project. Now, back in the fall, you were cautioned not to rule not to make your decision because the Mass Historic Commission had not yet received or evaluated the plans. So you met in September and October. In November, they wrote a letter, which you didn't see, that said, this is a problem. And then you got a letter. Well, you didn't get the letter. The library director got the letter. I don't know who else got the letter. But that letter said, this is not acceptable. This violates five standards. You know, it's kind of interesting. I was like, my goodness, maybe these standards are really hard to understand, really hard to find. They are easily accessible and they are extraordinarily clear. And I find it really troubling that I just don't know if you could possibly have read those standards. You yourself, not the Massachusetts Historical Commission, did the members of the Amherst Historical Commission read those standards and see what was planned and said, yeah, I've got no problem with that. I think it's clear now that the Massachusetts Historical Commission has done their job and told you this is a problem, that you've got an ethical, if not a legal obligation to rescind your previous actions, rescind your previous decisions, and apply those standards, apply the restrictions, apply the bylaws, apply the state laws, apply the federal laws. You have to fix a mistake that's been made. You made a mistake, but you need to fix it. And you need to do your job, which is historical preservation. And you've got a historic building that needs your care. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for that comment. Hi, Liz, you can unmute yourself. Good evening, Liz Larson. I reside on Summerfield Road here in Amherst. I am also the executive director of the Amherst Historical Society. And like a previous speaker, I'm not quite sure where to make my comments. So I'm going to be making them here in reference to some other previous comments. On behalf of the trustees of the Amherst Historical Society, we would like to take this opportunity to publicly acknowledge and thank the Town of Amherst, Jones Library trustees, Jones Library Building Committee, and especially, and most especially, Sharon Sherry for all of their work on the renovation and expansion project. The Amherst Historical Society is housed in a mid 18th century building immediately abutting the library's property with a collection of over 7,000 objects pertaining to the history of our community. 
One of the stars of our collection is the Groom Tree, a 280-year-old sycamore that graces the front entrance of the Strong House. During the past 18 months, representatives of the Board of Trustees have had many meetings with the library, the designers, and the town regarding the protection of the trees, the house, the gardens, and the collection. We have appreciated their willingness to listen to our concerns and to ensure that the needs of the grounds, gardens, all the trees, and the collection are part of the ongoing overall project conversation and ultimately the construction contract. As fellow keepers of the stories of Amherst, we are so excited and pleased about the much needed improvements that the new facilities will provide for special collections, as well as a new home for the Civil War tablets. Additionally, the improved public gathering spaces will create more opportunities to engage with one another and share our stories, continuing to build on the missions of both our organizations well into the future. We continue to appreciate the conversations that we have and regarding the various documents and agreements between the Historical Society and the trustees of the Jones Library, which when they are finalized as part of the ultimate con uh, construction contract, will I believe be made public. But at this time, they are not, they are in negotiation, in conversation. Thank you. Thank you, thanks for that comment. I believe this is our final comment, is that right? Yeah, there's still, so, um... Ken, you can unmute yourself, and if you'd like to speak, you can raise your hand. Um, uh, you know, there's still time. Thank you. I'm Ken Rosenthal. I live on Sunset Avenue. I want to uh, remind the commission that you have before you the plans for the entire uh, demolition and renovation of the library that Feingold Alexander Architects have chosen to just make changes to a few areas does not mean that you do not have the entire project before you. In fact, you should know that when this goes to bid in September, those few changes are not going to be the only thing on the table to be bid. The entire project is going to be bid. So that this is an integrated project that you have before you. And, and the town expects you to look at this as such, that you have a right and you have an obligation to consider the historic standards that you should apply to the entire project when you decide tonight whether to permit these to go forward as they are. I want you to also re remember that it's not your responsibility to worry about what happens, what might or might not follow from your decision to reject the proposed plans, because that's somebody else's responsibility. That's the library's responsibility and the town's responsibility. But I want to remind you that the Jones leadership has very practical alternatives for affordable renovation and repair. They've had them for years. Uh, the the um, members uh, know that they can repair and make the renovations that are necessary at a price that is affordable for the town of Amherst. And it, again, it is not your responsibility to worry about that. Your responsibility is just to focus on what you know about this library from the entire set of plans that have come before you and the comments that you've heard. Thank you very much for the time. Thank you for that comment. Hi, Lou, you can unmute yourself. Hello, uh, my name is Lou Conover. I live on Pulpit Hill Road and I just want to say that the law is very clear. The uh, Jones Library is a federally and state protected building and that carries with it certain restrictions on what can be done. The Your job as the uh, Amherst Historical Commission is to pass judgment on whether the plans uh, pass the, the the requirements of the historic, uh, the state historic and federal historic commissions. It's clear that they don't, and this the state historic commission has said that they don't. Your job is to uphold the law and 
advise the town on what is permitted and what is not permitted. It should be very clear. It is very clear. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for that comment. All right, Rita and Sean, you can unmute yourself. Hello. 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 We Hello? can hear you. Okay. Um, this is Rita. My husband Sean and I are tag teaming between this and the convention. Um, so it's my turn for this. And um, I'm sure you've read about or heard about our opinion about the project, but that's not what you're supposedly here tonight to um, hear again. I have a comment slash question. I'm not sure which is more appropriate because it's the comment section, but what I have to say is based on a question that I've had for several months now. Why were both letters from the Mass Historical Commission not known about until recently, especially given that one of them came in, what, 10 months ago? And in either case, may have impacted decisions that were made between then and when they were known about. And I think it's important to have an answer, which I've not heard asked yet, because what happens for me, based on my personality and training in a past life, it makes me very suspect that there may be other things that whether it's the town citizens or members of various boards and committees should know about and don't. So I think it's really time for the director to explain why those letters remained unknown, perhaps even to other people involved in the actual project, not just the ones voting on it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Is that is that all? There have been, I know Sarah, you had your hand raised at one point and some others maybe, they're not raised now. I guess it's, you'd have one more chance if you'd wanna raise your hand. All right, Sarah, you can unmute yourself. Thank you, Nate. <clears throat> I am Sarah McKee. I was a 22-year resident of Amherst. I am a, I'm actually Austin Sarat's pre predecessor as president of the Jones Library Trustees. I am also an attorney. <clears throat> and I'd just like to clarify that in interpreting and in, in applying the preservation restriction, which we will get to the Amherst Historical Commission applies the Secretary of the Interior's standards for the treatment of historic properties, just as the Massachusetts Historical Commission applied those standards in writing the letters that they did. So that those are the standards that you are by the agreement with the trustees are bound to apply. Second, I just like to um, co correct something about the state law. Interestingly enough, the Massachusetts Board of Library Commissioners regulations require any project receiving state any library project receiving state funds, that it comply with the state 
historic preservation law. And though it's differently expressed from the Secretary of the Interior's standards, it boils down to about the same thing. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay. Now at this point, um... I think there's one more hand. Um, okay. Oh, Sandy, you can unmute yourself. Yes. Uh, good evening. Thank you for. Turn it off. Thank you for this opportunity to contribute. Um, I don't know when to do it, and I wasn't quite sure the second thing was coming up. You've obviously heard quite a lot about the Massachusetts uh, Historic Commission's uh, opinion of this sort of thing, uh, with which I concur, but that's not my point. We earlier heard that these changes, and only those changes which uh, Mr. Surratt urges us to consider, are minor. They're not. To change an asphalt roof from the, set, uh, from the slate is like changing a top hat into a baseball cap. It makes the thing look ridiculous. Uh, and I think by then placing it against the uh, very large addition, the, foot, the, the change which we are not allowed to, uh, which was not considered, that is the footprint, you've got a building that is just not acceptable as uh, a historically uh, uh, meeting the requirements of the Historical Commission. Because... Uh, historical vision you're really dealing with perception perception of those buildings and unfortunately perception goes a wee bit deeper than the superficialities of the actual surface and it does include the interior perception perceptions are gained as you go into it so you can't actually ignore the interior as well it's perception of the citizens of Amos that matter and how you preserve that exterior and the potential views, including relationship to other um, historical buildings, such as the uh, stronghouse next door, including the tree, trees, uh, trees, that I think you have got to realize that small changes are not going to do it. And some of the ones that are being proposed are totally inadequate. Thanks. Thank you. Anybody else? I see two hands. They're from um, possible um, people who've already spoken. I don't know, Rob, uh, Madeline, if you want to limit them to a minute this time or. Okay, yeah, let's limit them to a minute. Rob, you can unmute yourself. Yeah, I, I try to be fairly gentle in my early remarks. Uh, I neglected to remind people that I live in Amherst, 49 band meter drive, but I happen to be on the West Coast. I, I think we've heard it from a number of other people that there are some actual issues of legal jeopardy among members of the Historical Commission tonight. And I hope they actually have done what's required of them by law before they continue in this meeting. I also think they're members of the library uh, staff and and trustees that I, I believe are also in some jeopardy. I'm not saying this as a matter of uh, threat, but I'm saying it as a matter of just pause a minute and think about what you're doing. And that's why, again, I say I think a six-month cooling off period might be a really good idea, everybody, including those of you who may be voting in favor of just going right ahead. I, I think you guys are skating really close to the edge of a very steep cliff, okay? Okay, thank you. Hi, Sandy again. Sorry, there's a question of buttons on the screen. Uh, I have nothing to add, to, uh, to add. Thank you. Okay, thank you.
Okay. Um, at this point, um, we move on to just discussion amongst commissioners, correct? Yeah, and I think at some point, you know, we could um, entertain more public comment, but I think this is, you know, the discussion uh, time for the commission. You know, I think there were a lot of comments spoken, and I, I understand it is confusing, you know, what part is the appropriate time to make comments, whether it's the demolition bylaw or the preservation restriction. And the reason why the hearings were opened uh, simultaneously is much of the information is redundant. And then, you know, how is it then used and applied to each of those hearings, either the bylaw or the restriction? And so, you know, even if some of the comments um, applied to the second part of the hearing, that's fine. You know, I think for the commission right now, in terms of the demolition review, it's really, you know, what's happening with the 28 building, if the 90s building is demolished, and then, you know, does the addition, uh, you know, impact the 28 building to, you know, in a way that there could be or should be a delay. And so the 90s addition is not considered historic and is not part of the discussion. And so if the library were just coming forward without anything other than a request to demolish the 90s edition, the commission would undergo a similar process because you know it meets the definition of demolition, more than 25% of a facade is being removed. Uh, but then it would say, okay, well, what's happening with the 28 building? And so, you know, to me right now, that's kind of the, the question. Uh, you know, everything else in terms of um, asphalt shingles and materials and landscape, that impacts it a little bit, and that's also really relevant to the preservation restriction discussion. Uh, but for now, with in terms of the demolition of the 90s edition, the construction of the proposed edition, and how does that really impact and relate to the 28 building? And so, you know, that's that's kind of the focus of the of the you know, I'll call it the demolition bylaw just to make it simple because if we say its name, it's the preservation for. Historically significant buildings, it sounds like okay. preservation restriction. And so I'll just call it the demolition bylaw. Okay, we have some hands. So um, Sharon, Sherry, would you like to speak? Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, I'm, I just, I needed to respond a little bit um, because a lot is being said that just isn't true. And, and so I guess my comments are to the Amherst Historic Commission. Um, you know, historic preservation has been a key part, has played a key role in this project since the beginning, 13 years. Um, and in fact, many of the design changes that have happened over the 13 years have happened because of public comment and um, historic preservation. It doesn't mean we can't change the building. As many people said, the library's not a museum. It needs to function. And the federal and state and local government, they all understand. We all want these beautiful historic buildings to last forever. And the only way they're going to last forever is if they are able to function for the mission of the lot of the of, of whatever organization. And in this case, we're talking about a library. The Section 106 process absolutely allows for these changes that we are proposing. Nothing that we are doing is illegal. If it were, I would have stopped it a long time ago because this is my this is my profession, my livelihood. Um, so uh, again, for the state to say, hey, there are these issues, the next step in the process is for all of us to get together in the community and say, hey, how do we address those issues? And that's what we are looking forward to doing in our next steps. We haven't done anything wrong. We're not going to do anything wrong. Um, uh, the programming needs and ADA accessibility is really important. And so I just, I needed to highlight those comments so we're not overshadowed by a lot of the misinformation that is out there. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Um, Antonia, um, would you like to speak? Yeah, thank you. I guess my question and my comment was related to going back to the preservation and protection of the 1928 structure. And I know that we spoke and said that um, the materials would be in the kind of second part of our conversation. But I guess I was wondering in going into regard whether 
demolition includes the idea of like replacement of um, the shingles? I guess my question more towards uh, Nate. No, the the that material uh, choice is um, more related to the preservation restriction, and so you know in our demolition bylaw, you know changing of the roof alone does not trigger demolition review, and so you know that's that that discussion is really in the second part of the hearing, and um, you know really right now it's the kind of the you know the focus is on the structure of the twenty eight building, and and then also you know how does the addition impact it, and so you know, the value engineer changes and what's happening now to the building and the site, is it enough of a change from what was previously reviewed that the commission thinks that there should be a delay or not? And so, you know, that's, that's the question uh, in terms of- So I'm of just going, trial. right. I'm just going to review our, in our determination in September of 2023, we um, allowed the demolition of the 1990s edition um, with three conditions that must be met to protect a historic building during demolition, to safely remove and store the Whipple window for reinstallation later in the library, and three, uh, the selective demolition and reuse of the Palladian window as presented. And so that's sort of what we what we decided um, last fall. And currently, there there are no changes in regards to where the new addition meets the historic structure. That has not changed. The plan has not changed. Um, now there is, you know, Nate, you've, been, you've also discussed how we could consider in this, the replacement and, you know, how the 1928 building um, aligns with the new addition in this demolition bylaw, but I feel I'm that's part I feel like is a little bit confusing for everybody. Yeah, I mean the bylaw does allow in its states, you know, what could be, you know, um, changed to the site. I guess when it was reviewed last year, the addition was already a part of it, and so the question now is, are there enough changes to the addition or the proposal? that now a demolition should be issued. And so for instance, if you mm -hmm. reviewed this last fall and there was an addition proposed and now all of a sudden they're saying, well, yeah, we're gonna put this addition on, that really changes it. But the addition was already part of the review last year. The changes now are, you know, right. you know, material of the roof of the 28 building or the windows, the removal of the roof monitor and other features. And uh, that's site. all the, right. Right. And so, uh, you know, so to me, that's kind of the, the the reason why the demolition review is happening again is because those changes, the building commissioner didn't want to say administratively that those are insignificant enough changes that he would just say, sure, let's just keep the demolition authorization from last year. He wants the commission to discuss it again. And so that's why it's here. Um, you know, uh, and, and so to me, that's, you know, that's the demolition piece. I think a lot of the discussion we've had and the comments we've had we've heard uh, fall also fall under the preservation restriction. And so, you know, I think last time the commission felt that the demolition proceedings um, were more straightforward because a lot of the 20 building remains, you know, some of the walls will be visible, some will be removed, some might be encapsulated. But the idea is that in the future, they, you know, they're, they're still there. And so the actual, you know, the you know, the 28 building will remain intact. And so, you know, the difference being with the preservation restriction, all of a sudden we're talking about the roof material. And to me, that's the discussion. That's where we should have that discussion, you know, with the preservation restriction, not now. Uh, same with the windows. You know, the windows is under the preservation restriction, not the demolition bylaw. And my interpretation is in MHC's letter where they take issue with um, the materials being removed. Um, and not replaced, which was mentioned in the public discussion. My interpretation of that was um, the interior changes, which we are not reviewing right now. So that was that was in regards to the, well, we don't have to even get into it, but as we detailed tonight, the exterior walls will 
remain just as they did in the last hearing, in the last plan. So um, just to address that, does, is there, commissioners, do you want, does anybody have any comments? No, I, I just, clarity for my own sake, <clears throat> you, you both have just helped with that. This demolition hearing is very narrow. It, it really it pertains only to the 1928 building. No, it's to the 1993 building. Isn't, aren't we, aren't we talking about the 1993 building being demolished? Yeah, the demolition bylaw. So this yeah. is the. Okay, so, so we're not discussing the 1928 building at all. We're discussing the 1993 and, and its effects on the 1928 building. Right, and we were discussing how the removal of the 90s edition, how will that impact the 28 building, and then what's happening with the 28 building with the new edition. And so, you know, what we've been told and presented is that, you know, most of the exterior walls will remain, you know, the Palladian, will, when, <laughs> Palladian window will be reused as an entry with the, you know, some of the side lights remaining um, in some of those conditions that Robin had mentioned. And so, you know, if, for instance, just the 90th edition was torn down and they were able to maintain the exterior walls of the 20th edition, then what we have left is basically the 28th building, right? And so, and but now there's this, uh, there's also a proposal that they're putting an addition on. So how does that impact the 28th building? So it's it's both the Nate, removal and then the addition. Nate, the, the MHC has said that the demo of the addition will have a ne negative impact on the 1928 building. They've said that. In, in those two letters. Have they explained why? Well, it relates to the, to the, to the, to the standards. I understand that, Hedy. And, 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 and sorry, was... Pat, can I just finish saying something because it relates to how I voted last time around. Okay. So once I had the demolition delay last time, I abstained. And I'm really glad I did now um, because I, I really feel like we're not oper we're not making this decision to de to de to allow the per to permit to demolish or not based on enough clarity around the impact on the 1928 building and and that was my question the the mass commission did not explain how it the removal of the 93 edition would impact on the 1928 building and that's really what's up in the air here right now well it, it's little things <clears throat> like the the idea to remove a section of the front wall of the building by the main entrance in order to put in a hole for the book sorter that now is has been removed through value engineering so that's one thing that hilda greenbaum mentioned um you know i'm, I'm very I'm trying to kind of absorb all the comments that have been made, which is practically impossible. Um, but I'm reading back through my notes and I'm very conscious of what Ali Gold said, where she said, imagine going into the future. And it's a little bit, you know, you could do this in ancient Rome as well. Go into the future and the Pantheon is suddenly not there, you know, or whatever. You know, that there is a, a, a moment in time where we could say, what if 30 years from now, We've removed the 1993 edition. We've made various changes that were needed, that we deemed needed to make this library go forward. Um, but then there were problems with the things that were chosen in terms of materials for that new edition. And that had to be demolished. And what would we be left with um, at that point? And it, it's sort of like trying to take the long view in all of this. And I know it's... I find it difficult and I'm a historian and I I object very strongly to someone saying that we're using history here as a roadblock. That is absolutely not my role here. And it's why I abstained last time because the 1993 edition, however compromised it was as a design for a 1928 colonial revival building, it it it's it's lasted this long. It's not a historic building. It's not protected, but 
it's it's created an, an a, a building that we could go back and look at and and see if there aren't other ways to to make this work um <laughs> I'm really frustrated. I'm listening to Romeo and Juliet, two households, both alike in dignity in fair Verona, where we lay our scene from ancient grudge break to new mutiny. I'm worried about Romeo and Juliet here. You know, the library is Romeo and Juliet, is the, is the thing that we want to try and preserve. I see two groups of people in two different places who both really love the Jones Library, trying to come together in the middle. And I've tried as a commissioner when we've been through these plans and these proposals before value engineering was even a question. To look at the very granular level at what we can do to make this building better, what we can do to make the programming better. I want all that. I want the civil war tablets there. So to, to bring history into it as if it's a roadblock is really really an annoying <laughs> um and maybe it wasn't intentional but i think that's why i had abstained about the original demolition delays that there isn't enough there isn't enough support for what is being proposed at this point I'm not seeing it Hedy, i respect your position but it's not our role to evaluate support our role is to look at the structures and and i i think we need to to continue to, to try to have clarity about that as we make a decision based on the demolition bylaws and based on the preservation bylaws and it's you know it, it, I, we talk to people in the community and there is a divide but it's not our role to pay attention to that our role is to pay attention to the regulations and the bylaws that govern what we do. Well, yeah, I, as you know, everyone mentioned the mass historic letters. So they mentioned that the, you know, certain facades will be demolished to make way for the addition. And then the North facade will be covered by the new addition. And so that's why, you know, previously I'd asked for what's changing and, you know, Hedy, uh, for the demolition review, I think that's important. And so, um, you know, the book drop to me is the, uh, is the preservation restriction, right? Um, you know, and I think, we'll, I think we should get into that. Uh, it, that's a good piece to get into. But, you know, if we stick just to the demolition piece, you know, um, Mass Historic said that uh, a significant portion of the west facade, north facade, and east facade on the children's wing, west wing, parenthetically, will be demolished to accommodate the new addition. The north elevation of the 28 building uh, will be covered with the proposed new addition. And so, you know, my understanding is that's what was reviewed and what was discussed previously and what was discussed tonight. Uh, and so I guess, you know, you know, Pat saying she would like clarity. I, I mean, what we've heard is that, you know, the, some of those exterior walls will be visible from the interior and there will be some demolition of those facades, but it hasn't changed from what was reviewed previously. Um, and I guess, you know, my question would be, uh, you know, in Mass Historic's review, they, they, you know, they seem to indicate that much of a facade will be demolished. And so, you know, I, I'd, I'd go back to the floor plans again, I'd like to, and just review those from ground level, first floor, second floor, and go carefully through those, uh, you know, so the commission can see that. Yeah, I agree. Can we pull those up? Everyone see them? Could you zoom in? Oh yeah. Thank you. So this is the ground level. Did you want to start there? Yes. So we are so MHC was concerned with the children's wing, the northwest east facades of it um, being removed 
dem demolished and then the north elevation being completely covered. So, so can you just show us where the children's wing is in each of these? Sure. Yep. This is so this is level one. And this wing here is the children's wing. If you can see my cursor. Yep. So this is the area that we had mentioned previously um, where there is demolition happening. So if we go back for a second to the existing plan, um, this is that wall. That is being removed. Okay. Is that and so? That's the original building there with the 90s addition to the north fit, or yeah. No? So the, the 90s addition is this piece here that goes right. Around. Okay. And so um, the 1928 wing is. It stops here, um, but then um, there's a piece of it here. What happened in the 90s addition is that there was some demolition of the 1928 building for the 90s okay. addition. And so that's what you're not seeing here because it was already demolished. But um, but this is how it stands right now. So an exterior wall on the north side of the children's wing is not the kind of 1928 exterior wall is no longer present anyways no that, due to the 19th no i think it's just interior walls that were demolished there okay. was also a 60s edition and it's tough to, to understand what was done when but this is original as far as we know and this piece is original as far as we know was that an exterior wall do you know that part this was not to my understanding. okay okay could I just say, just to be clear about this, the, the, the 1990s edition required taking out a, a piece of the back wall of the Jones Library. We all know that because when we walk from the old building into the new building, that's, that, that was all taken out. That's number one. Number two, what we are proposing does nothing like that. Number three, as I understand it, when you reviewed the proposal, carefully in uh, the past, you were governed by the same standards that the Massachusetts Historic Commission is citing. That means at the time that you made those determinations, we relied on the fact that the commission had done its job, which was to look at the 10 standards. And you made a determination in light of those 10 standards mm -hmm. okay. to allow the demolition to proceed. So, uh, I again, I'm I'm very grateful for the care, but I'm not clear what it is now that is the question. We have said we've not changed anything in regard to the to the demolition in these floor plans. So the 10 standards relate to the preservation restriction. And, you know, I think that going over these doesn't hurt because it adds clarity. And so, you know, if if they haven't changed, they haven't changed, but I just think it's helpful to see that. And so- Nate, I'm sorry. It seems to me that we're trying to have it both ways. So either the 10 standards are not applicable here or they are. So the- Refer so these Excuse are, me. Sorry, sorry. These are, these are two hearings open concurrently. One is for the demolition bylaw. And one is for the preservation restriction. The preservation restriction has the 10 standards of the Secretary of Interior for the rehabilitation of historic structures. That part of the hearing is happening after the demolition bylaw. The demolition bylaw is our local bylaw, right? For anything 75 years or older, if so much of a facade or so whatever, right? And so this meets the definition of a demolition. And really the demolition bylaw is, you know, so this library is significant. The commission allowed the demolition previously, you know, are the changes now enough that they could consider a delay um, up to a year or not? And so, but subsequently since that decision, there's been a lot of information, you know, even the mass historic letter indicating that some of the walls are being demolished or something's happening. And so what we're doing right now is just clarifying what is and isn't being removed from the 28 structure as part of the project. 
Uh, and so to me, that's just clarification. And so it's to help with the demolition review. When we start talking about the preservation restriction, right, that's where we will start talking about, to me, it's the change in the roof material, the windows and everything else that was enumerated in the presentation. And so for me right now, this is just clarification and confirmation that what was reviewed previously is still the case now. And so I, I'm not, you know, that's what it is for me is, you know, we're seeing what was, you know, reviewed last time in September, October, and just confirming it's what is being reviewed tonight. Madeline, I have a question. So if we are thinking about the demolition, and if what Nate said is correct, namely that the 10 standards do not apply to the demolition, then why was there a reference just made in regard to the demolition to the mass historics reference right. to the 10 standards? Right, because um, the standards do consider the reversibility of additions to historic buildings. And that includes um, the demolition of original material and to ensure that in the future, those new additions could be removed and the building would still be retained. Um, so that's a consideration in the Secretary of the Interior standards. And that element about demolition is what's guiding this demolition bylaw portion of our hearing right now, just to consider how the 1928 building is affected by the removal, by the additions, just um, kind of as a shell. And to, ins right, to ensure that um, the structure would not be affected through this process. So the MHC sort of, I, identification of that is, is helpful for us because um, just to make sure that we didn't miss anything before with that. Um, but previously um, we determined, as I said, um, I mean, we found that the Demolition of the 90s edition um, would be allowed um, with those three conditions. Um, commissioners, would you like to make a comment about or discuss whether that still stands? And if we can move forward with um, just deliberating on that. So <clears throat> I'm just looking to clarify because there was men mention from the Mass Historical Commission about the North Wall. And now I'm understanding that that was removed when the 93 edition was installed. Is, is that a correct understanding? The North Wall of the library, I mean- Of the 1928 um, building. And so I'm looking, this is in gray, this is the original. And this is the edition. Um, and so when there was mentioned by the Mass Historical Commission about the North Wall, certain walls being removed, do we have do we have a North Wall? If the edition the right, addition is removed and an addition, a new addition is put on. I think the MHC letter said that the north wall would be encased. So it exists. Does one of the applicants want to address this? I mean, I think if we went through this, just the proposed floor plans for the first, second floors, it would. Yep. Someone highlighted in blue right here. Yeah. This is that north wall that's in case that we went over previously. But I just, I also want to add that that north wall was changed during the 90s edition. It <clears> changed <throat> the window elevations. But now you, you, we, you will see that when you're on the inside of the, the edition, you're going to see that wall. 
that's the proposed. As you can see, that wall is highlighted in blue still. You'll be on that level and you'll be able to see that wall from inside of the building. Josephine, that's really helpful. Can you um, scroll down just a little bit so we can see to oh, the we, to well, who, the, who did the marker? Thank, yeah, yeah. thank yeah. you so much. I did. Sorry. Oh, that's mm -hmm. no, no, that's good. Thanks, Rachel. Yeah. That's where the Palladian window is, is, isn't it? Yes. Yes. Okay, good. I know where I am. And if we go, can we go to the second floor? Just look at the proposed um, level two floor plan. Or, yeah. yeah. Not sure if it's visible for everyone, but there is a red dashed line for the footprint of the existing. Mm -hmm. That's the 1990s, right, existing? Yes. Mm -hmm. So the existing north wall is how many stories tall? I don't even know. So at level one, that's currently the second floor. So it that's why it feels like you're a bit off on this plan. Um, so if we go to um, the floor plan, the existing floor plan of level two, um, you can see here that. So it's retained at all levels. Okay. This, yeah, that's the wall there that um, Rachel just highlighted. So in the proposed, this is where the addition, the northernmost addition of the of the proposal is. So it does get pushed back, but it, at that level, um, wish we had a Matterport scan open. If you can give Josephine, Josephine, at that point, isn't it the roof? It's yeah, I mean, it's tough to say exactly where the roof hits, but yeah. Yes. Right, it's it's not like a, at a floor level, it's a, you know, so a portion of the north wall will be removed, uh, but it's not at from a floor, like a floor to floor level. Maybe we can point out what is being retained, right? So I'll try my best with the pen. Yeah, so, and what's that? Yeah, all right, that'd, that'd be good. All of this, all of, all of this is being retained. You're gonna see the dormers, you're gonna see the roof. All of this is being retained. You're gonna see it from the inside. Mm -hmm. You're going to see the dormers, you're going to see the slate. Okay. Oops. Nate, do you think that addresses this? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I, you know, for myself, I understand what's happening. You know, I, you know, it's, 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 it's the commissioners. You know, if you, if you, if you're comfortable with it and understand it, you know, I, I understand what's happening now at the levels, and you know, it, it confirms that it's what was presented previously. I just, I wanted, you know, that clarification. Okay. Does 
that clear to everybody? Yes, thank you for that. Um, yes, thank you. Um, now, Hattie, do you have concerns that are keeping you from, do you want to discuss this further? No, I think, um, I think I would really like to continue the hearing and discussion and move on to the preservation restriction. It's, uh, almost nine o'clock. Um, right. one of our commission members isn't present. I thought she would be joining us tonight. Um, one of our commission members has to recruit herself. Um, I'm feeling we're a little, a little thin on the ground. Yeah. Um, I think, okay. I think but, this, this, sorry, this might be it, that only four commissioners will be attending these hearings. So I don't, I think, you know, the four that are here will just be the four reviewing this. Right. Okay. Well, um, now in the previous um, hearing in September, we were concerned about the Whipple window being removed and stored and the Palladian window being um, reused. Yeah, um, I mean, the commission, you know, could reaffirm what was done previously like I said, or could issue, you know, issue a, a, a delay of some time or issue a delay with other conditions. And so, you know, if we're, if Nate, we think think... we're comfortable with the demolition piece, we could have a motion and close this part of the hearing and continue with the preservation restriction piece. Or I'm, I'm not, or Hetty may have said, could we just continue the hearing for both pieces? Uh, last time we tried to you know, conclude one part of it and go to the next. We could keep yeah. both open and then now focus on the preservation restriction. So, you know, there's a few different ways how we could move forward. I, th I know that we talked about both of these windows and I know that we came up with solutions for both of these windows. And I'm satisfied that we arrived at a compromise, which is what I'm, where I'm trying to be tonight. Um, I'm a little concerned about the comment that the Whipple window is now sort of floating somewhere. That's not my, that's not how I remember it being addressed by FAA. Um, but I also think that we could move on to the preservation restriction, seeing as these hearings are open simultaneously and, uh, and begin to look at some of the other aspects of the value engineering. I don't think, uh, anything would be lost by doing that at this point. Yeah, I think it's a question. Mm -hmm. Yes. Do you, are we, is there a decision on that demolition delay? Shouldn't we have one? I wanted that too. Cause if there's a, if there's, if it's, uh, I, I don't know, I, I would assume you're going to vote on that. So then we can move on to the next one. And they're two different pieces. Right. So that's what the commission did last time. And what I was trying to say is they could follow a similar pattern and make a motion for the demolition piece now, or they could just continue the hearing, keep both open and make motions at the end for both. Uh, you know, you could do it sequentially, you know, as the way it, the kind of hearings are structured, or you could wait and make motions at the end of everything. But if we're, you know, if we understand the demolition piece, I think it would be cleaner to vote on the demolition bylaw now and then move on to the preservation restriction um, unless there's still questions, right? And, and you know, if, you know, that okay. was kind of the first part of the hearing. Um, can I make a motion um, to allow the demolition of the 1990s edition in keeping with the three conditions that were stipulated in the previous hearing of September, 2023? I will second that. <clears throat> I will third that. Will we have any more discussion before we vote? 
we can discuss. Okay, then um, shall we have a vote? Yes. Um, Hetty, yes. No, I'm voting no. Oh, sorry. sorry. I'm voting no. Okay. I'll, um, okay. Hetty, no. Mm -hmm. Pat? Yes. Antonia? Yes. And I, um, I say yes. Mm. All right. Okay, then um, I think we should have a, um, we should aim to discuss the preservation restriction tonight until about, we'll try and wrap things up at 9.30 and um, decide on a, if necessary, a, f a, future, a future date to continue the hearing. Mm -hmm. Um, so in this portion of the hearing, we'll discuss how the project complies with the preservation restriction. As detailed in the Jones Library preservation restriction issued in uh, 2022, the Secretary of the Interior's standards for the treatment of historical properties must be applied when reviewing any construction, alteration, repair, or maintenance to the building. A historic structures report for the library was also produced quite recently, and it issues more detailed recommendations for the treatment of the building. Um, and we have these in our meeting packets. As stated earlier, um, the HC has reviewed the project and the Historical Commission has reviewed the project and made a determination in October, 2023. Today, we um, we're going to consider aspects of the project that have changed since this determination um, in regards to the value engineering and um, also new information from uh, Massachusetts Historical Commission. So we have already seen a presentation from the applicant. Um, we'll open it up to questions from the commissioners. And then following that, we will have additional uh, public comment. So, um, we can have, I think it's, we can have um, questions, sort of let's bin them into the VE changes first. Um, so to discuss maybe the, the roofing, uh, the asphalt shingles initially, and if we have any questions regarding that, and then we'll hear, um, and then we can ask questions regarding the next point, if that's possible. Is that does that work? Um, so, does the um, I think does anybody have questions regarding uh, the asphalt sing shingles um, versus the then the synthetic slate shingles? Okay. Do we have questions related? Oh, sorry. Yes. I'm sorry. I, I was trying to unmute myself and get yeah, back. Sorry. No problem. Um, I, I've stated it publicly at the Design Review Board, and I, again, I had that question this evening in the initial discussion. Um, I think in the context of historical preservation, that at the very least, the um, faux asphalt, a faux slate roof is more consistent with the look that the library should maintain? Yeah, so, you know, and, you know, so with the preservation restriction, the commission could find that the asphalt shingles are just not acceptable and it needs to be removed from any bid documents. And if that's where you're going, that's what I would say, right? And so the only solution or roofing material would be one or the other. And so I wouldn't even leave it to like, oh, let it be an alternate if you feel strongly enough that asphalt shingles are not appropriate at all and don't meet the preservation restriction, I would just say it. And to me, that's where we're going. And so, if, you know, and, and so that's the way I would word it. And so, um, you know, we've already said we like, you know, we would allow 
synthetic slate. And during that discussion, it was also said that all the flashing would be copper, the, most of the gutters would be retained. And so I just would also want to ask that all those aspects that can be part of roofing, right? Uh, fascia and everything else uh, are all what was presented before. And, um, you know, and so that's, you know, if we're sticking with roofing, that's how I would go about it. Uh, and being and really clear about what you would, you know, what language you would use in terms of the roofing material. Well, is exactly what I was saying, Nate, but you said it more eloquently. So I don't know whether that eventually needs to get into a, a motion, but um, I, I, I feel strongly about that. If, if not repair of the actual slate, that would be the only alternative from, from my opinion. Yes, e echoing uh, Pat's comments, um, I think that at this point, the plans don't comply with preservation restrictions and standards, and I'd like to see the real slate come back. It's available. Ellen, do you have a yes, question or comment? I do. Um, if anybody, and I understand your opinion, Pat, but if anybody would like to see what an asphalt shingle looks like, we have an image. If not, that's fine too. I just wanted to say, um, Nate, that any new uh, gutter sections or downspouts that need to re be replaced will be in copper. Some of it's not in perfect shape, so we'll have to replace it, but it will look exactly like um, what's there now. It will just be new, new copper. Ellen, thank you. I, I did see your photographs of the okay. asphalt. And it, it, my opinion is that we need to use a synthetic slate, if okay. not the slate. Okay, thank you, Pat. And for uh, we have Mass Historic has approved synthetic slate on a project we did in Salem, Massachusetts. So we would be in keeping with their approval yes. with that. Yes, that's correct, Pat. Well, only by association. Um, I mean, it's, I, it's only by association, right? No, it's it's being approved more and more because it's a it's newer technology. Yeah, I think in looking at what our review is to preserve and protect um, the character of the building, especially given the fact that the roof um, it has such a slight high pitch, um, it is especially um, facing Amity Street and would require. Um, it's where the also community would be engaging also most just visually with the 1928 structure. Um, and so I agree with what has been said about if not repairing um, the original slate um, using synthetic. It's true, the, the roof is very prominent. Um, let's see, we'll move on to the um the windows so the current value engineering includes retaining the windows um it, what sort of repairs would be made to the to the existing windows and will there be insulation kind of added no Josephine, I'll take this, but feel free to chime in. The existing windows will stay in place, as will the storm existing storm windows. They'll be repaired where they're rotted. Um, in you know, if they're if they're not working, they'll be repaired. But in in general, we we'll repair the items that need addressing. And every all the exterior trim, as you know, is getting repainted anyway. So. It, 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 it's not um, a large scope of work because we are only replacing the window sash to be an insulated glass. Pat? I'm wondering if you've done a, a cost analysis of what the repair would be versus replacement and whether you've done a lead paint analysis on the windows. There's lead paint, Pat. All over the, the I, I would expect that yes. there is. Yep. So so that to make any repair, then you're bound to follow the regulations about 
And so I, I, I think there really should be a cost analysis of what it would cost to repair and re lead paint remediation versus replacement of the windows with historically appropriate windows. It's yeah, just to be clear, it, the window frame that's painted will remain in place, will be scraped and painted according with the, the laws dealing with lead paint. Um, the sash itself, we were originally going to replace that, take the old one out, put a new one in. This proposal is to keep that existing one, repair what needs to be repaired, scrape it and paint like we are doing to the rest of the trim on the building in accordance with the required lead abatement. Right, but my qu my question is, has there been a cost analysis? Be because I, I have dealt with this kind of thing mm -hmm. in historic buildings and oftentimes replacing the windows is the more cost effective follow all the regulations to rem remedy we, and still, we have, you know and still have windows that are not sound and tight right that's a that's a good point pat uh we we have we have a rough estimate but it's not fully vetted is that something you can do well um, one of the one of the things that pat we were suggesting uh, to the that we to the group is that our the drawings as they stand today are uh, new window sash. We are suggesting that we look at an alternate of keeping the existing windows in repairing them as they need repairing. So that's that's what we're asking the the this group to either say no or yes. It's just another. So then Pat will have a better sense of what the cost will be. It, wouldn't it be um, fortuitous to have an idea of that now before we go out to bid? Well, if it's an alternate, it, 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 it's not, it, it, we, can, we can do estimating, you know, over and over again. It's not a real price till we get a bid, right? I, That's, I understand that, but there is a market value to these things, to both the re remedial and to the replacement. And so I'm, you know, when we're, when we're trying to do a value bid, um, I, 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 if if I were doing this, I would have those figures, so we that have I would a figure, know. Pat, it's around a hundred thousand, uh, between a hundred and seventy and a hundred thousand dollars. And I don't quote me on this because I don't have that data in front of me. So it was enough of a value savings to put it on the value engineering list. And what would the new windows cost? I don't have that number off the top of my head, but we, it was, a it, so it's a, that, that number to keep the existing windows is a savings. It may make us bump up the size of the mechanical um, system a tiny bit to, because of the air leakage we would get with those, those existing ones. And that's what I was saying. It's not fully baked. There's a lot of pieces to the pie, but to it, to, Develop the pieces to the pie. We're looking for direction from this group. What if we can have it as an alternate? Because then it will be fully baked and we'll have a complete number. We can't. We we can't. We can't. So what? So yeah, Ellen. I guess so. Right now, the bid would be to repair existing. No, the base bid is new window sash, just as we were doing previously. So with a double, double, double glazed insulated glass. Yep. It, but it would match the profile, grill profile, and the yep. you know the glazing size and everything is the same. Yes. Yes. And if a question would be, if you were repairing just the existing windows, can every existing window be repaired, or are some going to have some sashes going to have to be replaced? So then you end up have a mixture of old and new. There, there's a couple that may need a little more, um, may need to be replaced, but you, but you will not tell the difference between old and new. I mean, just so folks know this, and we've said it before, our firm has been around for almost 60 years. We started the historic present renovation preservation movement in Boston. We, this, we are experts at this, right? We, I'm my whole career, I've been either replacing or restoring windows 
on all of our historic buildings and every, every, every project is different, but you, the, the quality of the new windows that will replace the existing, you will not be able to tell the difference. Well, I think if it's a mix, though, I, I think you will, to be honest. You won't. You won't, Nat, the, Nate. The, the profiles match exactly. It's, but it's the I, glare and the color of the glass, of the glazing. And so... It won't I, have the bubbles in it, no. No, I'm not saying it'll have bubbles, but I think from, and, and, you know, from a perspective, you can see the difference between types of glass and if they're insulated glass or not. And so if you have a replacement sash in a window next to a window that doesn't have one, I think you'll actually be able to see the difference in the coloring of the glazing. And so it's not gonna read as all the same windows throughout um, throughout the facade. Well, keep in mind that the existing windows, if they are kept, the storm is on them. So you're not gonna be able to read the glass equally. It's, you know what I'm saying? You're not, we don't actually see now the original glass. We're seeing the glass through the storm. What about the sort of rates of deterioration with the different materials of the old and new? They're both wood and they'll be painted. I can't tell you the rates of deterioration. So you, you, the new sashes would be wood and painted. It wouldn't be aluminum clad or anything. No, 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 no. And that is allowed. That does get approved these days, but we're not going that route. We're going with uh, uh, a wood sash or rest restoring, refurbishing the existing. It, it just feels like you were kicking this problem down the road with the windows because windows have a, have a finite lifetime. And and I, I know we're trying to save money. I know we're trying to, to maintain value and most importantly to get this project approved and, and by the by for funding but I, I think sometimes there's spending on something that is value added as opposed to value um whatever the term is um is is is, is worthwhile it's definitely worthwhile right no i understand your point of view Pat. <clears throat> Thank you. Okay. Just to continue our questions, and then I think we can discuss these points further later. Um, but removal of the roof monitor, are there any questions regarding this um, change? Madeline, like... uh, Rachel has her hand up. Oh, yeah, Rachel. Um, I don't know if this is the right point in the discussion, but it may be helpful um, for the design team to explain what an alternate is and what a base bit is to the group. Um, I don't know if that'd be helpful uh, because we're, when we're talking about options, there's a there's a priority in, in, in the bidding. Yep, I can explain that. Or, Josephine, you want to take that one? Sure, we could tag team. Um, and, and so good point, Rachel, about the, um, the alternates in the order. And so we go out with a base scope and that is what is, you know, that's the, the main number that we're working with. We go for alternates typically to, um, try and save costs or look at different costs of different elements on a project. And so with public bid, the order of the alternate that is, placed is the one that we is the order we have to go with and so um depending on how many we are actually putting into the bid docs um that would be the if there was more than one that that would be the order that we would um be going in um and that know, you, you, you wouldn't you add. yeah you wouldn't have you wouldn't if we had this as an alternate you wouldn't have to accept the alternate, right? We were doing that really as a cost, you know, just trying to confirm the cost with an actual bid. But but to Pat's point, you know, uh, windows have a, a a lifespan, so it, it's it's that's very true. So it's that's 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 up to the commission if they want us to pursue the alternate or not. I I personally would like you to pursue 
market pricing on new versus um, repair, because I think you're going to end up with a mix. And to Nate's point, I think there should be a consistent look. Um, and, and without knowing what the repair costs are and without knowing what the market value for new windows are, we, we really don't have an alternate here, in my opinion. Well, I think, you know, for the preservation restriction, it's the appearance of the building. And so if the commission feels that new sashes throughout is what will make a consistent appearance and it's not differentiated between what's there now because there's storm windows and some screens and actually having a replacement sash with, you know, a, an exact uh, grill profile and everything is actually more beneficial than, again, like the shingles, I would say that's the only thing you want and there is no repair. You would not allow repair of the existing windows, right? So you'd want to say it in, the, in, the, in that kind of language so that they there is no alternate anymore. It is just that. Right. And so, but if you think you want the original windows, then you would say it. So I, I would want to make sure that as we're going through the preservation restriction review and then these changes, you know, the motion would be, you know, clear in terms of the windows. Is it yes to only the replacement or is it yes to maintaining existing and not either or unless you want it? Right. But that, that doesn't provide guidance either, you know, then they can do the alternate. If you roof material again, if it's only the one piece, you just say it, and you don't want asphalt shingles. You know, if it if we're moving on to the next piece, just be really clear, yes to the whatever we're talking about or no. I, I think it's I don't want to I I would you know unless we really think we don't really care about all these and it can happen and we let it happen and the bid go and all these changes are good. But I'm I'm hearing that there's probably some opinions, um, on, on these on on these elements that we could have a clear you know, some cl a clear motion that incorporates them. Well, my opinion, Nate, is that in, unless we have a cost analysis of new versus repair, th there there can't be a um, choice because it sounds like we're going to have a mix. And no, I, I, I think, yeah. well, I would say then either it's all replacement sashes. <laughs> Who cares about cost? It's about the appearance and the look or it's all repair existing and there's no mix of old or new. And to me, that would be part of the motion. It's all the same window. It's either all replacement sashes and repaint the trim as Ellen said, or it's all keep the original and no mix. And that's, that's how you're, that's how I would have my motion as the commission right. and not leave it up to who cares about the cost. It's really about what do we think it's going to look like and the impact on the building. And so, if if the replacement sashes end up being more expensive, but that's what you think is in keeping with the preservation restriction and it works, then it works. And so I wouldn't worry about doing a cost analysis of of it. It's um right. I well, that's part of it, Nate. That that's why we have these alternates. Is but, is is part of the cost analysis. And and we can't we we can't choose an alternate if we don't know the comparative costs it, this is just my my experience doing these kinds of things and in in order to have a cost um savings you need to have a cost analysis of comparative and so um i, I i'm just expressing my opinion yeah. on this can I, Pat, you're asking really good questions. So let me just give you a little background from where, where we got the number. So we went back to our est estimator. And again, I don't have the estimate in front of me. And we went through it with him. Okay, we're going to repair, we're going to keep the existing sash and the storms. And we are going to re repair them as required. What would be the savings of doing that? And he came back to us and said the savings would be in a ballpark. 70 to 100,000 or a little more than 100,000. That's the number that we have. And that's from the cost estimator. So that's the savings he's projecting, Pat. In this current year. Correct. Uh, well, and, yes. And yes. So that's what we, I guess, what we need to look at. But um, I just need to voice my opinion. Yeah, I, and I agree with you. And I, I think Nate's approach is a good one, is it's either 
because you see that it's probably simpler than it's all new or keep or keep existing. And I I would be good with that. I just believe we're kicking the can down the road to expenses in the future, but that's not our problem today. No. Yeah, but Antonia, you, could just, oh. you could just tell us you want a new sash, Pat. That's what we have in the drawings now. Well, I'd like to hear from the other commissioners. Antonia, would you like to? Speak? Yeah. Um, sorry, I went quickly to get water and I was I might have missed this if this was already shown, but would it be possible or has it been done since maybe it, it hasn't been proposed an alternate? Are there photos um, of between the new sash and an old replacement? Or would that be possible? We don't have, Josephine, I don't, We'd have to dig something up. We right. we've done this analysis, but we probably did it a year ago. Um Just a question. Yeah. Because it's a detail that we actually have. Okay, well, sure I we I mean, I think that it's just sort of assessing what we're saying here. It just seems like we're concerned about consistency and mm -hmm. what Nate said that we just want all of the same window, whether it's a replacement or or um, or keeping the originals, mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure if that does that capture what you believe, Pat, or you would like only replacements. Um, Madeline, I'm I'm questioning the cost efficiency because okay. that's the other side of this coin. I think from the historical commissions with our purview, we that's are not, concerned with right the that's not our that's not our our ballpark. However, it's a question that needs to be asked because we're asked to be to to um, approve all, alternate choices. And so I feel like there's some information missing about that, but um I, I think e either all the same, of a repair of the existing we'll worry about down the road or replacement but there needs to be a better understanding of what the the costs are because that's why we're that's why we're talking about this petty yes i'm i think uh, from a sustainability point of view all new sash makes sense Okay. Um, and from a historic <laughs> preservation point of view. Well, I think the two are connected. I think of course. In practice these days is good sustainability practice. That, um, that being said, I, I think Nate's suggestion to getting us past this is that it all be repaired and the same or all be replacement. But I think that the architectural firm needs to do a little more cost analysis to help us to know what the best um, proposal sh should go in the bid. Okay, okay. Um... Now, at this point, we're approaching 930. So we it's been three hours. Um, I suggest that we find a date for a future um, time to reconvene, if that's if everyone agrees. <laughs> um, how do we go about doing that? Nate. You know, we need two days to post an agenda. Uh, we need to continue it to a time and date certain. I mean, you know, like, you know, do we, do we, can we do next week sometime? I mean, I would start there and then. Okay.
you know, I mean, Tuesday would be the earliest Tuesday evening. We could post the agenda tomorrow and um, and then there's Wednesday. I mean, it, that, that's what I would say is Wednesday or Tuesday or Wednesday, the 27th or 28th at, you know, 6.30 or 7 p.m. work. And if it doesn't, then we just go to the next week. Um, Tuesday and Wednesday work for me. Wednesday works for me, but not Tuesday. Both work. I can do Wednesday. And I, I, I would need to make it 7 p.m. for me to get there, to be there. So it would be the, the 28th at 7 p.m. Okay. Is does that, that, work, that works for everybody? Ellen, yes. does that, that work for you? And Josephine? Yeah. It's, we were wrapping up our drawings next Friday, but that'll have to be delayed because we need a vote on the landscape as well. And, and I, I'm a conservation commission member in Amherst and I have a meeting next Wednesday night. We could take a five minute break and try to meet and discuss this for another half hour if, or not. I mean, I don't know how people are feeling. It's, it is, you know, it is 930, but. We would love to do that, Nick. We're just, it, this is very time, time sensitive. Um, getting the drawings out, done and out for bid for a favorable uh, time of year, mid-September. I'm willing to extend this evening. I can do it. Okay. Could we, would we need to um, reach a motion on everything then in order for them to have information to, for the drawings? I mean. Yeah, I think we'd have, you know, there's a few more points from the value engineering, if we had questions, we'd still might want to take some public comment and then, you know, can we reach a point to make a motion and decision? So, you know, I'm not sure if we can get there tonight, but I, you know, if we want to take a five minute recess, come back at 9.35 and say, we'll go, you know, to like 10.15 or whatever, I'm, you know, I feel like once I start a meeting, I'm not, it's not like I'm going to go do anything else tonight. <laughs> can't, come the lawn, can't come over the lawn right now. <laughs> if if <laughs> but, everybody uh, can... If everybody can stay, I think that's the best alternative. Isn't okay. it also the case that the, the people who are listening in who aren't commission members need to be able to comment on the yes. aspects of the preservation restriction value engineering information, especially from Rachel for the landscape? Mm -hmm. I mean, I know things aren't going to be resolved tonight. I, I just have a, that feeling, but I, I would feel some closure, especially for FAA and Berkshire Design, if they could complete their presentation to us tonight. Okay, I think that um, we can, after a brief pause, we could move on to the public comment and then, um, then have our discussion. Um, so we'll start with public comment at nine thirty-five. Okay, oh, Matt, Madeline, that's that's really great. I do want to just reiterate, if it is at all possible, may not be, it would really be great if the commission could make its decision tonight, because otherwise, if you can't, you can't. And I understand that, but. The, this is, as Ellen said, time sensitive. So if whatever you can do to try to reach a decision tonight on all of the aspects, that would really be great if you can do it. So many of the people making public comment were straddling the two, both preservation and, and uh, demolition. And so we wanna make sure they know that we're continuing. And if they continue with us, wonderful. Okay, so we'll we can be in at nine thirty-five. Okay. Yeah, everyone okay. can take you know everyone can mute their 
fix themselves or turn their cameras off and we have a four minute break.
Okay. I think we can open up to public comment. I just want to make sure Pat is also here. All right. Thank you, Nate. Sure. Uh, let's see. Are you ready, Madeline? Yeah, we'll, we will limit um, comments to two minutes again. Um, okay, yep. All right, Letitia, you're allowed to talk. Thank you very much. And I wanna say, first of all, how much I appreciate your willingness to go late on this meeting and to try to finish it up tonight. Um, uh, I want to comment on and actually compliment uh, the, the design team on the landscaping uh, modifications. I particularly love the no mow um, grass in the back and the soft waves that's going to um, create and also the greater sustainability of that solution. So kudos on that. That's my only comment. I will keep my comments very brief in the interest of moving along. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Hi, Hilda, you can unmute yourself. I just will also be very brief. When you talk about saving seventy-eight dollars to $100,000 by keeping the old falling apart windows, you're talking bubkas in a $50 million budget. I don't think it's even worth talking about it. You should replace the windows, provided they are historically appropriate windows, that they match what's there. And get rid of the ugly storm windows because I know you'll end up paying more for electricity and heating and cooling if you don't replace them. So it doesn't make sense to go. And if anybody wants to come and look at my reproduction, 1737 windows and see how they were done, they're welcome to come see it because not only did they change the panes between the, the mountains, but they also insulated between the interior boards and exterior boards, which make a huge difference and the windows fit tight now. So to me, it's a no brainer. Go replace them. It's not worth arguing over $100,000, which may not be true either in the end. Thank you. Carol, you can unmute yourself. Thank you, uh, Carol Gray, A15 South East Street, Amherst. Uh, I would um, give a little background for myself. I am an attorney. Um, sorry. Um, I'm an attorney. I uh, also I have a JD. I have a master's in law from Georgetown University Law Center. I'm very concerned that both the town staff person and the president of the Jones Library trustees uh, have implied that you can't revisit the initial decision of whether this project as a whole complies with the uh, preservation re restriction agreement. They, both the Jones Library and presumably the town, had the smoking gun that any jury would need, which is the letter from Bri Rona Simon saying how the, the, the guidelines from the Secretary of Interior's standards are being violated. You are not provided that. That, in my view, is misconduct. I think that you can't be a jury, you can't be jurors and not be presented the most critical evidence of a case and then be told by the people that withheld it from you, the staff of the town, presumably they have it, the president of the Jones Library trustees, they certainly had it because the letter was addressed to Sharon Sherry. They failed to disclose that to you. You were at an incredible disadvantage deciding a case without the most critical piece of evidence. And what does that letter say? The letter says specifically the proposal violates standards two, five, six, nine, and 10. What does, for example, standard 10 say? It says new additions and adjacent or related new construction will be undertaken in such a manner that if removed in the future, the essential form and integrity of the historic property and its environment would be unimpaired. Clearly, that is violated. You could just on that violation alone say this project as a whole violates the preservation um, agreement. Now, you might say, well, how do we know? Well, the preservation agreement 
If you read page three of the agreement, it says in section 2.1 that, uh, that the, uh, there's an obligation to maintain uh, require replacement, rebuilding, repair, and reconstruction of the building whenever necessary in accordance with the Secretary of the Interior standards for the treatment of historical properties. The following page of the preservation agreement says in section four, the standard of review, grantee shall apply the secretary standards. So you have no choice but to apply that law. You have a letter from the most authoritative person in the state saying that those guidelines are violated in five different ways. To just say that, well, let's not allow asphalt shingles. Well, of, co of course you shouldn't allow asphalt shingles, especially when that letter, by the way, says that, uh, that the Buckingham slate on the highly visible Gambrel roof is proposed to be replaced with synthetic slate, even though the historic structures report states that Buckingham slate is still quarried and available as a roofing material. The removal of the historic slate roof, which is highly visible and a character defining feature of the building and replacement of synthetic slate does not meet the standards, standards two and six. The law is crystal clear and you're not applying it. And no offense to people who are talking about cost, but there's nothing in the legal standards that say that you should even look at cost, nothing. You look only at whether the historical integrity of the building is preserved. And even talking about these details, you're shuffling the, sh the, the chairs on the ship of the Titanic. Like the project as a whole completely violates the standards and you have okay. to apply the standards. Your, your, your point should be, and you're, and you're here to say whether this project complies with the preservation agreement. It's not go change the, 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 sh the slate. No, you vote it up or you vote it down. As it's presented to you today, you know for a fact from the most authoritative source, it violates at least five standards. Your legal duty is to say, no, this is in violation of the preservation agreement. I move to to state that this is in violation and you you have one duty to preserve the historic integrity. And Thank I don't you. think you are experts to say that that, and some of you seem to have not read the letter. You're saying, what does the letter say? I think you should have a break and everyone go to read the two page letter because it, it and, and also the secretary's standards. If you weren't provided those by town staff, how could you ever know how to make a legal ruling if you weren't provided the law? You haven't read the legal standards. You can't be a juror making evidence in a legal way. You're just going to set the town Thank up. Thank you. For Thank you for your comment. Hi, Maria. You can unmute yourself. Thank you, Maria Kapicki, South Amherst. When the Amherst Historic Commission last discussed and voted on this issue in September and October of 23, it did so without the knowledge of the findings of the Massachusetts Historic Commission. We've established that. And those that commission said that these this project would violate five of 10 of the Secretary of Interior standards for rehabilitation of historic properties. You know, <laughs> This is this is not that complicated. I the, your your chair tonight has said that you need to consider the new information. So consider it, please. While the Amherst Historic Commission is not responsible for the information that should have been shared with you, it does bear responsibility for knowing what those standards are and applying them to all projects that come before it. The demolition of large parts of the 1928 building, the removal of the Buckingham slate roof, the massing of the new addition relative to, historic, to the historic building were all known last fall and are incontrovertibly forbidden. The AHC has no had no basis last fall to find that the plan complied with these standards and it has no basis now to find that when, to find that when even more violations are proposed like asphalt shingles. Were it not for the single bid coming in $7 million over budget, that error that was made would have gone uncorrected. The proposed plan, known to violate the standards for years, should never have gotten as far as it has, but that's not your problem to solve. You have a second chance tonight to do your duty, which is historic preservation. You need to find that this plan does not 
meet the required standards of rehabilitation because it doesn't. You just have to find what has been demonstrated to you. That's it. Please do your job here. We are relying on you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, right, Sarah, you can mute yourself. Thank you, Nate. Um, Sarah McKee, former library trustee president. I would just like to correct a statement that was made about the project's compliance with the Massachusetts Historic Preservation Law. This project, the Mass Historic Commission, sorry, Historical Commission, informed the town manager and the library director in December of 2016 that the information that the library had provided to the Mass Historical Commission in connection with its application for a state grant was insufficient. And the letter told them what they had to supply. They did not supply it in 2016, 2017, 2018, 2019, 2020, 21, or 22. In 2023, when the federal grants came through, all of a sudden, because the federal grants likewise required information about the project, they provided the, the information which resulted in these letters from the Mass Historical Commission that, that the project had the deficiencies outlined. So I would like to make it clear that yes, there was a deficiency efficiency on the part of the town to provide and trustees to provide the necessary information. And I imagine that contractors associated with the project were well aware of this defect. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for that comment. Hi, Jeff, you can unmute yourself. Thanks. I'm just wondering by what legal basis you could say that this hearing is only narrowly focused on the value engineering changes. I mean, you have new information now from the Mass Historic Commission that found seven adverse effects and violation of five of the Secretary of Interior standards for historic rehabilit rehabilitation. Um, that tells me that you clearly got it wrong the last time, in last October, and you should be correcting that decision. Um, I would just point out also that in the preservation restriction agreement, there's a covenant to maintain, the library is supposed to be maintaining the building in good repair, and I don't see that happening. So, thank you. Thank you. Hi, Arlie, you can unmute yourself. Um, hi again, Arlie Gould, South Amherst. Um, just a couple things. Um, first, you know, I, I saw in the proponents' letters and I just heard it tonight from the people presenting, speed, we need speed. And it just reminds me of a saying, your lack of planning is not my emergency. You know, the they got themselves into this pickle and that's not the Amherst Historical Commission's problem. That's one thing. The other thing I keep hearing is the Jones is not a museum. Yes, we know it's not a museum. And none of the historical buildings that the Historical Commission uh, protects are museums.
But I would also say that if it's not a museum, then why do we need all this space to display these Civil War tablets? That sounds very museum-like. Um, you know, people have suggested maybe space could be found in the library if those were housed in a different location, possibly the new Wildwood empty space. Special collections could be argued as another museum-like uh, activity going on in the library. So to keep saying this isn't a museum, I think, uh, isn't quite accurate. And one last thing, sustainability can be achieved with a repair uh, option. Uh, and the greenest building is the one that's already been built, says Carla Lefante, head of the architect uh, association for many years. So, you know, what, when we do, um, if we don't do this project, there will still be a lot of sustainability that can happen. All the historic preservation will be okay and like that. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Arthur, you can unmute yourself. Hi, Art Keen, Dennis Drive in Amherst. I'm Emeritus Professor of Anthropology at UMass. Early in my career, I was director of the UMass Archaeological Field School for about a dozen years, and I worked in historic preservation across Western Mass and in collaboration with the Massachusetts Historic Commission throughout the 80s and the 90s. I'm also a member of the Amherst Historical Preservation Coalition. I sent a detailed written comment to the commission, and I hope that you'll consider the details therein. But here's the gist. As currently proposed, this project does not meet the standards to preserve and protect the historical resource that is the 1928 Jones Library building. In my professional judgment, the plans degrade the building's historic character, dramatically alter its appearance from the primary street view on Amity, stand in violation of the library's own historic preservation restriction agreement and violate state and federal historic preservation standards. The plan's indifference to historic preservation stands in glaring contrast with the architectural, inter architectural integration and compatibility of the addition to the North Amherst Library. You, commissioners, have a statutory obligation to protect and conserve the historic character of the 1928 building and to enforce the preservation restriction that the library signed with the town in 2022. And to do this, excuse me, <coughs> sorry, and to do this solely in terms of the impacts of proposed alterations to the historic character of the building. Arguments that have been offered concerning costs, pressing deadlines, community needs have no place in your deliberations. While you determined in October of 23 that the original design did not violate the library's historic preservation restriction and had no adverse effects on the historic structure, the MHC found otherwise, stating unequivocally in letters that the proposed design violated five of 10 of the Secretary of the Interior's standards for rehabilitation of historic properties. You may not be, have been aware of those findings at the time, since the library director withheld them from the public until July 9th of 2024. But you are aware of them now and you may not ignore them. The project sponsors are obliged to answer what they intend to do to address each of these identified violations, as well as violations of its own preservation restriction, which prohibits modifications to the exterior of the building. To date, they have not done so. You, as our local guardian of historic resources, have an obligation to enforce these regulations as well. You should return the proposal to the sponsors and ask them to return it to you only when they have seriously addressed the violations of regulations and standards and as required provide proper proposals to mitigate the adverse effects that have been identified. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that comment. Hi, hey, Elizabeth, you can unmute yourself. 
Hello, um, I'm Elizabeth Sharp. I live on Summerfield Road and in my work life, I'm co-executive director of Historic Northampton, where we have three historic houses and a historic barn all on um, the national and, and state registers. We, we are subject to the same local, state and federal restrictions that the library project is. I urge you to determine that the project design does not comply with the Amherst Preservation Restriction. The Mass Historical Commission's review states clearly that the library design does not meet the Secretary of Interior standards for the rehabilitation of, of historic properties. It violates five of ten of the of the standards that's fully half of them i mean to me that's shocking and i, I can't believe the project has gotten this far with 50 percent of the standards not being met somebody hasn't been doing their due diligence um, in the specific case of value engineering um, for the specific cpa compliance the roof covering the idea of the asphalt sh shingles is is just not workable um, the original is slate. It has a completely different look. It ages differently. It has a different texture. It'll look different over time. It doesn't look the same as the as the um, asphalt or the imitation slate alternative. It just doesn't. And to put anything else on the roof would just be wrong. And I think you know that. Um, and addition, additionally, the um, the um, in the comments from the Mass Historical Commission was about the massing of the building and the size of it sort of looming over and dwarfing the 1928 structure. So that needs to be addressed as well. I believe that creating a modern useful facility like a like a library doesn't mean sacrificing historical integrity or the distinctive architectural features. You can do modern and you and you can do historical. You can do both and make them work. And the, the historical features are the strength of the project and you should use them and you should protect them. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for that comment. Hi, Christopher, you can unmute yourself. Sorry. Hi, um, it's Mickey Rathbun, not Christopher, um, but I'm using his computer. I just like to start by saying, I think it's inappropriate and unfair to pressure the commission with time constraints and say we've got to wrap this project up tonight. I mean, time constraints are not a concern of the Amherst Historic Commission. They should be concerned with applying the relevant standards. Um, this meeting, public hearing, could have been held three weeks ago on August 1st if the town had complied with the 14-day public notice requirement. They didn't, so now we're having this meeting on August 22nd. Um, that's not the Amherst Historic Commission's fault. Uh, this hearing process has been complicated considerably by the fact that the library director withheld important information regarding the mass Historic Commission's findings regarding violations of those uh, standards, five of the 10 standards of the Interior Department. Um, if the Amherst Historic Commission had received this information when it was received by the library director back in March and again in April, um, excuse me, I think it was December, at any rate, if you had received this information in timely fashion, as you should have received it, um, we still haven't heard Sharon Cherry's explanation for why she never put that material out to people. <clears throat> but you would have had time, you would have had several months to consider what was said in those letters from Brona Simon about the violations of the standards. And you would have had a lot more time to think about how to go forward. But as far as I know, these letters, perhaps even 
haven't been read yet by all the members of the commission. I, they were just provided very recently in your packet in preparation for this hearing. So for the library expansion proponents to say tonight at 10 o'clock, we've got to push this across the finish line tonight and get the votes is really inappropriate. And it's, and it's just giving short shrift to the town regulations and the historic uh, commission. Um, I think that you should bring this hearing to a halt tonight and continue it later. Thanks. Thank you. I believe that was the final comment. Is that right? Yeah, I don't see any other hands raised. Nobody else. Uh, um, okay. There had been one and it disappeared. I don't know. Oh, Michael yeah. Greenbaum, perhaps. I don't know what keeps happening. Michael, you can unmute yourself. You, can you hear me now? Yes. Oh, good. I'm sorry. This has been a confusing screen for me. <clears throat> I'm Michael Greenbaum, and uh, I want to briefly say I understand why your focus is on structure, the structure of the buildings. But I would hope that the commission would take a more expansive view of its charge. I mean, the term landscape is in your charge and it's not quite the same thing as landscaping, which is a part of the landscape, but landscape is a much broader uh, idea. And I think that the Massachusetts Historical Commission had that in mind when it talked about the impact of size and spacing on lots and that sort of thing as a concern of the Historical Commission. I think it hammers particularly on Amity Street it should be a concern of the historical commission because that wonderful block between the common and uh, prospect street has all sorts of beautiful buildings that represent different historic eras in our town's history. And I've been here long enough to remember what the Southeast corner of Amity street was like before the building that is now the Bank of America replaced a really sweet bank, the Amherst Savings Bank, where I got my first mortgage, uh, which complemented all of Amity Street uh, so beautifully. And so I wonder whose responsibility it is. I don't know who in town would have a broader view of the role of landscape, of streetscape, of skyscape, and I think in terms of Amity Street in particular, the incursion of a very large building, and it's really only the size of the building that I'm concerned about, is a matter of historic preservation and its impact on the streetscape and the skyscape and the landscape of this beautiful stretch in the middle of downtown, I think should be a matter of your concern. Thank you. Thank you. I see Ken Rosenthal as well. Hey Ken, you can unmute yourself. Thank you again. I don't want to take a lot of time, but I just want to add something because in a perverse way, it's 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 fortunate that the notion of value engineering has brought the commission together again tonight because you were not fully informed when you made your last decision last fall without having this meeting tonight, you had every right to reopen that decision once you received that information from the state that had been withheld from you. You didn't do that. You probably didn't see it. It's in your packet. I'm not sure you've read it, but I just wanted to add my comment to the, those of others that that, that that was compelling information that you should have had. Now that you have it, you need to attend to it. And you have you should not worry that you are limited only to considering something called value engineering tonight. The entire project is on your table and you have a right to consider it. Thank you for hearing me again. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, 
Okay. I think that's all the public discussion. Um, yes, I mean, to address the three letters that were received from MHC, we they're in the packet. Um, they're dated November 2023, December 2023, and April 2024. Um, they were reviewing the MHC for these letters was reviewing the tax credit application, which is includes uh, exterior and interior changes. And they apply the Secretary of the Interior Standards to review that um, those alterations. Um, and today we're reviewing based on the preservation restriction, which is exterior changes. So some of the um, standards that MHC states are in violation may not apply to our deliberation today. Um, but some noteworthy statements that I found are that the new, so um, in the letters, they state the new addition will be visible from the south, the front, uh, the south, the front elevation. Um, the proposal entails, um, well, that we already de determined that uh, demolition. Um, and they quote the historic structures report that the L running off the east wing is a secondary facade and evocative of the rambling L's found on early dwelling houses of the area. And that would be um, impacted. And that the proposed project violates standards two, five, six, nine, and 10 of the Secretary of Interior standards for rehabilitation of historic properties. Um, so, which includes um, the historic number two is the historic character of a property shall be retained and preserved. The removal of historic materials or alteration of features and spaces that characterize a property shall be avoided. Um, standard number five is distinctive features, finishes, and construction techniques or examples of craftsmanship that characterize a historic property shall be preserved. And they find number six um, is in violation, which is deteriorated historic features shall be repaired rather than replaced. And number nine, new additions um, or related new construction shall not destroy the historic materials that characterize the property. Um, and number 10, uh, new ad additions and adjacent or related new construction shall be undertaken in such a manner that if removed in the future, uh, the essential form and integrity of the property would be unimpaired. Um, now, back to number nine, they say the new work shall be differentiated from the old and shall be compatible with the massing size scale and architectural features to protect the historic integrity of the property and its environment. Um, we did not have this information last fall, although the commission did determine that the um, project does meet the Secretary of the Interior standards for rehabilitation. Um, so I find it difficult to kind of understand whether we are we can consider these letters or not um in our in our deliberation as new information or if we only should be considering the value engineering changes i mean yeah i mean i'll i'll you know i'll chime in and say that the historical commission can have a different opinion than the Massachusetts historical commission. And so if the commission reviewed it and found that the massing was appropriate and then the Massachusetts historical commission said it wasn't, it doesn't mean that the historical commission, local commission was wrong. It's just a different opinion. And so, uh, you know, if this information is enough to open the hearing again, then the commission can discuss it. But, this information was provided after the commission had already made their decision. Uh, whether or not it was provided in a timely manner, that doesn't matter. It was done after the commission had already uh, reviewed the project. And so, <clears throat> you know, the commission did go through the standards. It's in the online packet from 2023. You know, the question now is, did the commission have a different opinion than Mass Historic? And, you know, is that enough reason to open the hearing? 
you know, if, if for instance, if this were, if this wasn't value engineered and there was no changes made and we received those comments from Mass Historic related to the tax credit program and not the preservation restriction, would the, would the commission reopen the hearing because of this letter from Mass Historic? And I'm not sure it would, right? Um, the commission had made its decision in review. And so, you know, if we feel strongly enough that that's for some reason we didn't have a thorough enough review, then we could do it. But, you know, oftentimes there can be information provided after a fact. And, you know, it's not illegal that the local commission has a different opinion than the Massachusetts Historical Commission, right? We, in fall of 23, we had the architects provide computer renderings from all different angles. We looked at the massing, the height, the view from Amity Street. And if the commission thought that the view from Amity Street, yeah, the new addition is visible, but it's set back a distance. It's not overwhelming the view. If we, if we felt that way, if the commission felt that, okay, it's visible, but it's not impactful enough to have a, an impact and an adverse impact, and you made that decision, then you made that decision. I don't, to me, it's not wrong. You know, Mass Historic is saying, well, their view is it's different, right? They have a different opinion. And so I'm, I'm, I don't think the commission, you know, was illegal in making that decision. It was your review and your, you know, that's what was made at the time. And so, you know, if, if there's another preservation restriction on a building and, you know, there's an addition happening, you know, if we want to, you know, um, you know, if we get an opinion months after the fact, would we reopen a hearing because, you know, there's a different opinion now? I'm not sure, you know, we would if the commission really went through the standards and made that, you know, made their their findings. And then that's what it is. I, you know, I, right. I've spoken with the building commissioner about it and, 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 you know, and a town attorney, and they're not convinced that it's necessarily needed to reopen the hearing just because of that, you know, new information. Right. And the MHC letters were received after our determinations. Right. Um, I think that we should just go through these uh, VE changes and determined sort of our, our findings for each. Um, so next would be the the removal of the roof monitor. I, I don't think that's um, an impact to the historic character of the 1928 building. Um, raise your hand if you, Pat, what do you think? I, I think it's not an impact and yeah. I was present at the design review board and it was explained to me and it was to offer more light to the room below, but that room has a bank of windows. So it does not seem like an impact. Right. It would be make the roof possibly even less visible from the street, which is favorable. Yes. So it's favorable. Um, the Changing the curtain wall windows to pre-glazed aluminum windows. Um, Josephine or um, Ellen, what, which, what is that? <laughs> what does that change? Josephine, I'll chime, I'll go and you can chime in. So it just it changes the um, depth of the window system essentially. Um, okay. and you, you won't be able to tell the difference. And actually it's a, it's a more energy efficient window. So it's a, it's, it's to us, it's a, it's a, it's a win-win because it's going to help us with our energy savings. Okay. Is that at the X, the, the rear? Yes. It's at the addition only. Okay. And it's at the punched windows of the addition. Okay. Is there a, any comment from the commissioners regarding that change? Not for me. Yeah, I was, I was gonna just, sorry, I was muted. I was gonna share my screen. So the curtain windows in the original, it's gonna get pixelated. Um, they, they're punched out essentially, right? So you can see there's a depth 
on the exterior. And so yeah. that's only on this this area. The rest of the windows weren't. Um, and so with the change, you know, it, it's, you know, they're essentially flush with uh, the exterior cladding like it was, you know, and it has been on the on the other sides of the library for the, of the addition. So, you know, if you can see if you can see that. OK, you know, yeah, they're I'm flat. Just, yeah. You're right. OK, well, that's not really. I don't think that's a concern either. Anyone else has a different opinion? Um, so let's move on to the landscape items because I think that there are some things to talk about here. Um, so the um, in our previous hearing, we determined that the removal of the memorial garden was justified because of the 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 garden that would replace it and the landscaping that would take its place. And now that's been altered to this sort of these basins. Um, which I'm, I would say is not quite an appropriate um, substitution for or the loss of the Memorial Garden, but what do the commissioners, what does everyone else say? Yeah, Heidi, you're muted. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. I think all along, as long as I've been on the commission and as long as I've been deliberating about the Jones Library um, demolition and addition, new addition, it's the uh, north, the south, wait, let me get my orientation right. Rear, the rear north. Rear part of the library that has concerned me the most. The bumped out nature, the new addition, um, while trying to echo a sort of barrel vault or gambrel roof vis-a-vis -vis the strong museum um, just feels out of scale. Um, I thought Berkshire Designs landscape features in the original proposals before value engineering were charming and uh, had a lot to recommend them. And I see all of that value gone. I don't see any value engineering. In other words, I see a lot of removal of value, especially for our community, especially for our young people. I don't feel like that backyard is a place I would want to hang out at all. But especially with young kids, you know, I just think it's it has none of the charm of of the proposed um, landscape features of the original proposal. And I know that landscape details are often vulnerable when considerations like this happen of budgets and financials. And um, I really feel for. Um, for them in relation to this project because they brought so much that was of value, um, especially to the exterior of the of the Jones and its relationship to the community and to Amity Street. Um, so I have a lot of concerns here that we're not we're not we're not we're not in tune with the history and the vibe of this building. It, it talked to us in 1928, and in 19, 1993, there was an attempt, and I agree with some of what um, the lady from the public comment said about it. It's awkward. It creates problems for wayfinding. I know that's true in that library. Um, but it's what we ended up with in 1993, and now we need to kind of hold on to that that conversation that we're having with the past um, in order to go on to into the future. Um, and I think I'll just leave it at that. I'm I'm really, I'm really distressed at, at where this is going. Um, I need more time. Um, I feel like we're being pushed to make decisions because of things that weren't deliberated carefully enough earlier on in the project. Um, whether of a fiduciary or a um, legal or a financial considerations or to do with the, the bidding process. 
I just think it's ended in our laps and I'm a little bit angry that this has happened because it shouldn't be on us that we're having to deliberate with all of this kind of maelstrom of public comment from all quarters happening around us. We should be able to just do our jobs and it's actually really difficult. Thank you. Yes, Pat. I comment on the the landscape. Mm -hmm. um, there was a garden that was emotionally established and revered and respected. However, the Kestrel Trust has transferred the most prized plants from that to their property in South Amherst. And so I, I believe that that is not a consideration as we discuss this tonight. What is of consideration is the value um, changes to the plan. And I think that the, well, the, the gardens that were first proposed were charming. I think that the grasses that are now proposed as a cost-saving element, and I know I'm not supposed to talk about that, but it's green. And it, and it is green. And that is what is important about the, the background of the of the addition and and that can that it, it, the plantings proposed can be delayed and 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 in the future and and that's been established that the mowing grasses the annual mowing grasses are green and the plantings that were originally proposed can be can be added in the future when funds are available. I think that for this to um, be a focus of uh, our deliberation um, in terms of preservation is um, distracting us. Yeah, um, I know it's replaceable and right that something can be added further down the line for when when we talk about landscape. Um, yeah, Nate. Yeah, I mean, I echo what Hetty said. I think that you know the preservation restriction is also guiding you know what happens to the landscape, and so to me right now, the removal of mature trees and you know replacement with three detention areas and not gardens or any landscaping is not really appropriate right and so if you know so so part of the the you know when the commission reviewed it before it was in a, the, in totality the landscape was really complete and to me that justified removal of mature trees and alterations of the landscape on the site and so what's happening now in the back of the property is not only a reduction in the landscape, it's also, you know, removal of the Goshen bench and some other things. I think the cumulative effect is something that Hetty really, um, you know, noted really well. And so to me, it's not, you know, it can be replaced. I think the preservation restriction is, you know, to me is does the removal of those trees, is it is the what's replacing it, you know, sufficient enough? And, you know, I'm not sure it is. And so I, that's where I'm going. It's not whether or not it can be replaced in the future, it's what you're being presented with yeah. now. And so what was presented before was a really, you know, comprehensive uh, landscape plan. And that's been changed significantly, in my opinion, right? The drainage infrastructure, say out front being removed and piped is not, was never visible and not visible. And that, that has that, you know, to me, that's, that's of no consequence, but the way it's changed the 
landscape in the rear is to, to me is really significant. Uh, and so I think that's something the commission should discuss, not, you know, it could be done in the future. I think we should discuss, you know, how it is impacted. Yeah, I'll also I say it's, I also say it's 1030 and it's getting late and I, you know, we've lost a number of attendees and I don't know if it's worth trying to rush this. And so I'm comfortable continuing it to seven o'clock on the 28th. Right. I, I, I actually right. don't think it's. I think that's it. best. I, I just need to say, Nate, that the architects and the and landscape architects said that the trees that were originally planned remain. We're talking about the gardens and they can be um, deferred. So, so in my opinion right now that some of the mature trees along the boundary with the historical society that are going to be removed were removed because they were actually having some nice plantings and gardens in, in, in place of them. Right now, I would actually say that the removal of those trees is not appropriate because what's being what it's being replaced by isn't a garden and landscaping that matches what's there or what is appropriate. And so, so uh, you know, that's how I, that's how I would read it. I wouldn't say, Oh, it could, a tree could be planted. I'm saying what, What's being removed so, now and what is shown to be replaced I, with is I need different. more information about what's not being forwarded because in our presentation tonight, we we discussed that there would be an ancient tree preserved on the historical society and that trees as originally planned are planted behind the library edition. And so I, 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 this is not to argue the point. It's just, it, it, there needs to be more clarification. Madeline, before Rachel uh, answers that question, I would like to clarify a couple of things. So I want to, I have to agree with Pat that the Kinsey Garden has moved uh, to, to South Amherst. So that is no longer a consideration. The, the landscaping in the, the back of the library needs to be done over again. And back in 1928, when the building was originally built, there was no landscaping anywhere, front, back, or sides. It was all grass. And so now these plans that we are presenting are actually more closely related to what it looked like back in 1928. The fact of the matter is, is we can't afford those previous uh, plantings. We just can't. Um, and same thing goes if, you know, if this whole project dies tonight um, or next Tuesday at 7 p.m., uh, the backyard it has been gutted and it needs to be redone and it will be grass because that's all we can afford. The other thing that I wanted to say was the trees are going because of the building, the uh, uh, the extension. Uh, one of the trees is going because it's, it's growing into the sewer line. Um, so I just, Rachel, take it away. Those are my thoughts, Sharon, also. Um, I, I will say that the, the garden area does retain, um, we're reusing the Goshen stones from the site and creating the windy paths through the garden area. Um, we do have uh, boulders for seating along the way. Um, so there is there are still some of the functional um, elements. There is still the working seating area in the back. And these, again, really good bones that can be added to over time um, as, as funds, funds avail. Um, and I think also an important notice is that the, the area behind the library does receive stormwater from the Historical Society property, and we're reducing the amount of stormwater and leaving the property with this work, which is important for sustainability. Okay, I am. Um, I think we should adjourn until. Wait, hold on, I just want to share my screen for just a quick second. Yeah. So this is the point I'm making. When we reviewed the plans last time, this mature tree right here is would be removed, right? And it would be replaced with a swamp white oak. But there was also other gardens and plantings happening here. But what what is it, what it's being replaced by now is just a detention area. And so in my view, the removal of that tree 
and replaced with a detention area isn't necessarily appropriate with the restriction. Sorry, it, it takes too long to load. And so if I were from from the from the preservation restriction standpoint, whether or not the tree was there in 28, it's actually a significant landscape feature now and is what it's being replaced by, you know, appropriate. And so I would I would say that the removal of that mature tree, you know, before was was appropriate because of what was proposed in it to go in its place. But now to me, I would question whether or not removal of that tree is appropriate. And so that's what the restriction does, right? If there are significant landscape features like, you know, ledge and rock, and that's being removed and it was replaced with something, but now it's not, that's what the restriction can, you can look at. It's And so I wouldn't say, oh, in the future, it could be replanted. That's not the proposal in front of you. It's what is it, you know, what's happening to it now? And so I get it that a few other mature trees will be removed because it's for the um, new building. And that's, you know, that to me, that's not changing. What's changing now is, you know, there's three detention areas and the two paths. And so I would argue if you want to keep the detention areas and not do the plantings, eliminate one of those walkways, keep that mature tree and do something. And so, right, because that's what the restriction can have the commission do. I, I really think that the loss of the landscape in the back is a, also a really significant piece. And Nate, I, I'd like, like to add to your comments that we are, it's, we're not just doing a basin, we do have mature shade trees in the plan, in the proposed planting plans. Those have not changed from the, from the proposed, original proposal. So we Can have- show those, grass. Rachel? Yeah. So people just, I know everybody wants to get off, but just so it's, people can understand that. Sure, let me find out. The visual. I don't find you playing. Um. Can, can everyone see this? Um, so this is the proposed planting plan in the back. Shoot, come back. Um, we're protecting this existing tree. Um, we have a, we're proposing a large a swamp white oak here and a swamp white oak here. Um, we have a sassafras tree here that we're planting. This is the ash tree that we're protecting. And then we have some fringe trees and then we're protecting these existing trees over here, the maples. Um, this is the one of the basins. This is the second largest basin and this is the smaller basin. Um, all of these are needed to balance the stormwater for the project. Um, then the areas in between the paths are planted with, with the no-mow mix. And then we do have the stepping stone um, walkways that wind through the garden area and connect to the historical society. Yeah. And that's a demonstration of the NOMO mix that yeah. you're proposing? Okay. Yeah. So if we continue it, I would I would actually recommend maybe having a side-by-side -side of what was shown back in September and October, including the grading and what is shown now in the lands in, in any illustrative landscape plans. Um, and what what mature trees are being removed. Rachel, what day are you available next week? I'm available Tuesday. Um, next Wednesday, I, I, I'm I on the commission. I can't, can't attend. Can we meet Tuesday? Yeah, I can't, I can't be there Tuesday, okay. but maybe- I can't either. So is Thursday a possibility? I won't be there. Who said that? Nate, I'm I'm at, I'm at the ZBA meeting. Okay. I mean, we could meet during the day. I mean, it doesn't have to be in the evening. Well, I could meet during the day. Um, A little unusual, but midday most any day next week. Me too. We can be, make ourselves available. 
easier in the middle of the day. So, Madeline, what works for you? Um, uh, I'm just with my kids all day um, next week. So, um, I think an evening evening's better. I can't do the middle of the day. Could we do it earlier in the evening? So what does Monday look like? We don't have time to post it. Okay. So Nate, help us know when the earliest we can meet. It was Tuesday. Tuesday's the earliest. And Hedy and I can't do Tuesday. Right. And so who can do Wednesday or Thursday? How about Wednesday earlier, Rachel? Are you... Yeah. What time's your other meeting? Seven o'clock. So five. I, yeah. I I can't meet Wednesday until seven. I'm I'm tied up until seven. I can't meet in the evening. What about Thursday? No, Nate can't do Thursday. Um. How about the following week? about in the morning the second of September. One day. that's a holiday oh sorry yes of course it is um can we do so morning next week i could do morning next week but madeline that's probably uh, difficult i can't do that i'm no oh. there's no school in session oh right, right. um well yeah, i Tuesday the third works for me. I can do after seven. I can do Tuesday the third at any time. Shall we say that seven PM on the third? Eddie, can you? Um I have a stand thing every Tuesday night and um, but I'm feeling, you know, pressure, um, to try and step up for this very important work that we're doing. Um, so I will try and get out of my, <clears throat> my chorus. Well, we choose another night that week. What about Wednesday? Do Wednesday. I could do that. I have planning board Wednesday evening. <laughs> uh, okay. Um. So I just want to reiterate again, I'm sorry to intervene. We really appreciate this. This hearing was originally, you know, we were hoping to do this in the 1st of August. We're hoping to get the designs done and go out to bid in September. Uh, we have invested a tremendous amount of time and a tremendous amount of money so that we could do the value engineering process, get through the approval processes in town and go out to bid in September. So it, whatever you all can do to complete the process that you need to complete before September would be really helpful to us. Could we do, so I, I mean, I could maybe do next Tuesday. I just, I don't know how, how long I can be away in the middle of the day for like an hour. <laughs> um, the 27th of August. Miss Type, we have to post it tomorrow. You know, I wouldn't say it couldn't be any sooner than noon. Is it is it 48 hours, Nate? It is 48. OK. So, also, I know what you're saying at the same time, I mean, I don't, these are volunteer commission members and we were, you know, pretty rushed to try to get the hearing scheduled. And so typically when a board continues a hearing, it's just to their next scheduled meeting, which is often two to three weeks away. And so, you know, we're really trying to accommodate this, but if it needs to be a week out, it needs to be a week out. I, you know, I'm not going to ask Madeline to, 
rearrange her schedule and Hetty to miss something. And I'm not, you know, I can't skip a ZBA meeting. Uh, and we need all four members of the commission that are here tonight to be at the next hearing. Uh, so, so Nate, is the 27th the after after afternoon time? I can't really do that. That's just not. No. Okay. So Madeline, tell us when you can. Well, I can do the next week. I can do the 20. Well, I can do the 28th at seven. And I can do the third and the fourth those evenings. I, I, you know, Rachel, we may have to do it without you, but yeah. that wouldn't be good. I mean, we're going to talk about the landscaping next. <laughs> right. Yeah. I know. I, I, Nate, like what? Uh, yeah. Can we, and we can't next. start early because Nate, you, you can't get there before. So. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm, I'm tied up like, basically every night of the week. And so to put an extra meeting in is. But you're free on the 28th. I could skip my commission oh, yeah. meeting. But that's. Oh, Nate, I thought you were free on the 28th. You're not. Is that what you're saying? I am, I am after seven. Okay. So, Hetty, can you be available on the 28th? Yes, she said she was available on Wednesday, the twenty eighth. So yeah. does that does that work for everybody? It works for me. We'll make it work for us. Okay. Nate, you're gonna have to apologize to Aaron for me. <laughs> you could, yeah, I mean, I don't, you can. I mean, conservation commission has full agendas every every time now. Goodness. Um, if we were going to continue it to that time, we just need a motion and a vote to continue it to the twenty Wednesday, the twenty eighth at seven p.m. Okay, I motion to extend the hearing to August twenty eighth at seven p.m. Seconded. All right. All right. All right. Again. All right, madam, there's a second. Can we do a roll call vote and then we Okay, vote. Pat? Yes. Yes. Antonia? Yes. Hetty? Yes. yes. And I am a yes. All right. All right. We'll so see you now. Yeah, it'll be a new Zoom link for everyone still on. It'll be posted on the calendar. Um, yeah. And then it'll be seven o'clock on this twenty eighth. So thank you. On behalf of all of us from the library, we want to thank you. Mm -hmm. We also want to say how grateful we are for the commitment of everyone in Amherst. Whatever their view is, we're grateful. They've invested a lot of time. So we'll look forward to seeing you again soon. Thanks so much. All right. Till the 28th. Thanks, everyone. Thank, thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.